Good morning. Welcome to the February 11th, 2021 meeting of the FCC's Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment. It is good to see all of you again. Today is the meeting with several firsts. It is, of course, the first meeting of the full committee this year, 2021. It is the first meeting under the administration of Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. Welcome, Chairman Rose Chairwoman Rosenworcel. And finally, it is the first time that the ACDDE has been joined by all sitting commissioners. As you know, this morning you will hear from all four of our commissioners. That is truly a testament to the importance of this committee and our gratitude for all of your hard work. We continue to be astounded by all you have accomplished and all you continue to accomplish. In this regard, I want to thank Anna Gomez, Chair of the Committee, and Heather Gate, Vice Chair of the Committee. You have truly done a phenomenal job of steering the committee in such challenging times. I know we have a very packed agenda. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel, who has some opening remarks. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, good morning to everyone. It's great to be here virtually with the FCC's Advisory Committee for Diversity and Digital Empowerment, AKA the ACDDE, which is honestly still a mouthful. Now, this is your first meeting of the year, and as you can see by my presence, that's not the only new thing around here. We have a new operation with some new folks and some new thinking and some new priorities. And case in point, one of my first acts as acting chairwoman was to elevate Dewana Terry, who heads our Office of Workplace Diversity, and Sanford Williams, who runs our Office of Communications Business Opportunities, to posts as special advisors to my office. Now, I believe we should prioritize diversity and expanded opportunity, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do. You know what holds back innovation in our country? It's not lack of talent, it's lack of opportunity. Studies show it. They also show that when young children exceed in math, what plays a major factor in whether or not they go on to become an inventor is their family's income bracket, their gender, and their race. Now, my guess is that doesn't surprise a single person in this audience. But one finding from a team of academic and government researchers led by Professor Raj Chetty may grab your attention. According to their research, innovation in the United States would quadruple if women, minorities, and children from low-income households became inventors at the same rate as men from high-income families. You heard me right, quadruple. They call this the lost Einsteins phenomenon. To put it another way, you don't have to be an Einstein to know that this inequality of opportunity is holding us back in a big way. Now, there's another key finding from this research that I found particularly relevant to this group. They looked at the women and African-Americans and Hispanic-Americans who defied the odds. What they found was that exposure to inventors and entrepreneurs had a huge impact. In other words, if you can see it, you can be it. I believe it. I know how much it matters in my own professional life. I also know that for all of us to see a little more clearly, we need to promote mentoring programs and internships and networking we need everyone to bring someone else who may not be just like them to the table. And in the spirit of Shirley Chisholm, if they don't make a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Now, these are the kinds of things this advisory committee is all about. It's what you have been working on. It's what I want to encourage you to keep at. And if this pandemic politics and all of it hasn't worn you out, then know you have my support to keep it up. Not only that, you can step it up because I will make sure you have whatever agency resources you need to do so. Now, this committee is charged with providing recommendations to ensure that disadvantaged communities are not denied the wide range of opportunities made possible by next generation networks. And I know you've worked on adoption issues, including last year's workshop on the role of libraries in adoption and literacy, but nothing 
has shined a light on the challenges brought by lack of broadband like this pandemic. It has revealed hard truths about the digital divide, the homework gap, and the consequences that come from being disconnected. Because those who cannot connect are denied. Denied access to education, jobs, healthcare, and opportunity. We need to fix that. The good news is that we have some initiatives underway that can truly help. This agency is looking at how to close the homework gap, seeking comment on how to update the E-rate program. So no student without high speed service at home has to sit in front of a fast food restaurant just to do their nightly schoolwork or go to online class. Congress too has taken note of this crisis. It is working on new legislation right now in the form of the homework gap and also it has passed legislation with the emergency broadband benefit. And this new $3.2 billion program will provide substantial discounts to help low-income households get online. We are right now getting it up and running, but programs like these are most successful when we get the word out. So today, and you're hearing it here first, we are establishing a website where stakeholders can go to register their interest in helping to promote this new emergency broadband benefit. So sign up at FCC.gov forward slash broadband benefit because we all have a part to play in this effort. And I hope every one of you will join us as we seek to raise awareness about this opportunity to get more of us connected. But for now, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking so you can get to work. But before I sign off, there are a number of people I wanna thank. First, a big thank you to the ACDDE Chair, Anna Gomez and Vice Chair, Heather Gates for their leadership. Thank you also to our working group leaders, Caroline Beasley, Rudy Briache, and um, the doctor in the house, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee. Uh, I also wanna thank the FCC's Media Bureau staff who contributed to this event and the work of this committee, in particular, Michelle Carey, Sarah Whitesell, and Brendan Holland. And special thanks go to Jamila Best Johnson, Julie Saulnier, and Jamil Cadre for their service as designated federal officers for this committee. Another thank you is to Jeff Rayardin and the Commission's AV team for the epic work they do behind the scenes so we can all meet virtually. But above all, thank you to all of you for volunteering to be a part of this effort. I know how valuable your time and energy is, and I am grateful that you are spending it in, su in support of this committee. Thank you again. Now let's get to work. Thank you very much, Acting Chairwoman Rosenworcel. Next on the agenda is Commissioner Starks. Commissioner Starks, have you joined us? I have joined. Wonderful. Hello, all. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for letting me participate here. Uh, it is always good um, uh, to be in conversation with you all. And truly being able to, um, you know, talk to this uh, distinguished advisory committee again uh, on diversity and digital empowerment. These are issues that I deeply believe in, continue to push for, advocate for, and, and I deeply appreciate how you all uh, continue and amplify uh, the necessary work, spotlight uh, many of the issues, significant issues before the commission, and that includes empowering disadvantaged communities to fully participate in the digital space, accelerating the diversity of ownership, participating in the media space, and of course, increasing opportunities for people of color uh, and women in this space. And so continue on your service, your contributions, and it really does inform and add value to my work and the work of the commission. So thank you and keep on. And so at the risk of obviously stating the obvious, we continue to be in a historical inflection point uh, on so many fronts. And at the same time, we are starting year two of our battle uh, with the COVID pandemic. We are, of course, enduring the lingering effects of an economic crisis that has laid bare widespread job losses, food insecurity, the in inability to cover the costs of housing, uh, and of course, a persistent lack of universal broadband access. And just as inflection points in history bring challenges, they also, of course, bring opportunity. Uh, and so here we are at a new beginning, a new administration, new opportunities uh, to make progress on issues for which the needle 
uh, in many ways has not moved in some time. And despite their importance, despite the regulatory and statutory mandates to address them. And so, of course, I'm specifically talking about as well the commission's responsibility to promote and ensure diversity in the media ownership management and employment space, something uh, that we've all been focused on here for some time. And as a commissioner, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to advance diversity in the media industry. The FCC, uh, I deeply believe, must make sure that every aspect of this uh, industry, from who owns a license to who sits in front of the camera, must reflect better our diversity. And so to be even more clear, we must do that better job in fulfilling the commission's obligations to promote ownership, participation by women and people of color. And why is this? Rhetorically asked, of course, because we ask, uh, because we see and hear, and who we see and hear it from impacts the way we view our world, our society, and ourselves. You know, I want my young daughter and son to see and hear the content that speaks to them in a personal way, delivered by people and viewpoints that reflect uh, an informed diversity of America. And so to achieve that, we're going to have to double down on finding effective ways to improve ownership and employment diversity. And these are not far off concepts. You know, recent stories in the news highlight the importance of this committee's continued hard work to foster diversity in the media and tech space. You know, one recent investigation highlighted allegations uh, that a major television broadcaster had cultivated a hostile work environment that included bullying female managers and blocking efforts to hire and retain black journalists. Even closer to home for me personally in December, the Kansas City Star went as far as issuing an apology, acknowledging <clears throat> that over the decades, through its news coverage, the paper had, quote, disenfranchised, ignored, and scorned generations of black Kansas citizens, close quote, and, quote, robbed an entire community of opportunity, dignity, justice, and recognition, close quote. You know, um, uh, other papers, including the L.A. Times, have made similar public apologies. And so there is clearly still hard work for us to do to ensure that owners and employers at media companies look like and serve their communities. And so the bottom line is we should continue. We must continue to find innovative ways to diversify ownership, open up employment opportunities for those currently underrepresented in the industry. And so, unfortunately, the monstrous COVID-19 divide likely will make this harder, not easier in the short term. People of color have traditionally had less access to capital, to opportunity, uh, which accounts for some of this disparity. And we know that businesses owned by people of color have been hit hardest uh, during the pandemic. You know, one study shows African-American businesses were particularly hit hard, experiencing a 41% drop in business activity, Latinx businesses down by 30, 32%, Asian-owned businesses dropped by 26%. And so these are some of the small businesses, of course, that also make up the ecosystem for advertising. Uh, the point is that these numbers are going to reverberate throughout our community. Uh, and so looking forward, we should keep in mind that this crisis has brought unparalleled opportunity uh, to focus our efforts on issues of fundamental fairness, equity, as we rebuild our economy, rebuild our workforce, and empowering small and minority-owned businesses is part of that equation. And of course, uh, the work by broadcasters is a key part of that equation. And that's one thing that I love about this space. It gives us that opportunity to be innovative, solve the complex problems, and imagine and create the world that currently doesn't exist. And so let me close, of course, by again thanking you all for your engagement uh, with the Commission on these issues. I deeply appreciate your hard work. Uh, the opportunity to join with you here today. And of course, uh, everyone, please stay safe, uh, stay safe and stay health healthy. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you very much, Commissioner Starks. Next, we will hear from Commissioner Symington. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and to have the opportunity to speak today at my first meeting of the ACDDE. We are now midway through its second term, and I look forward to lending my voice to renewing its charter this year. Four years on, it's clear that former Chairman Pai's vision in forming this committee was thoughtful and valuable, and my thanks to him for taking the initiative in doing so. The work that the ACDDE does to empower disadvantaged communities and accelerate women and minority small business ownership in the telecommunications sector is vitally important. 
Already in my short tenure as commissioner, I've been heartened to see the breadth of the uh, commission's efforts to unleash the promise of both advanced communications and more traditional media to this purpose. I recognize the importance and difficulty of the work in expanding not just access to telecommunication services to every American consumer, but in expanding the franchise of women and minorities in the telecommunications and technology sector. I view the FCC as playing an indispensable role in this. When the commission was initially created, media ownership concentration rules reflected the view that diversity of viewpoints was critical to an informed and engaged citizenry, and so public interest demanded that diversity of viewpoints be protected. And the commission has worked hard to accomplish that goal uh, throughout its existence. Later, and to the FCC's credit, the ambit of viewpoint diversity was expanded to incorporate a diversity of lived experiences, recognizing that for so many in the United States, opportunities to compete on equal footing in telecommunications work or telecommunications business ownership was foreclosed. A healthy citizenry is not just informed by different intellectual points of view, but also by a multiplicity of lived perspectives. And our mission as an agency does and must reflect that fact. Former Chairman Wheeler was noted for favoring the phrase, where you stand depends on where you sit. I submit that for some, it has been standing room only because they were not offered a seat. We must endeavor, however we, uh, we can, to make it right. The FCC through the ACDDE has made important strides in this area, which I'll take a moment to acknowledge. Initiatives under the current ACDDE charter in include working with libraries, academic institutions, and society groups to highlight and address the acquisition of digital skills in underserved communities, examining how best to expand inclusion in the digital space, and how to partner with public and private institutions to support and foster digital literacy. Um, they also working with technology suppliers and investors to encourage access to economic opportunity available in the technology sector by means of supporting alternative access to capital and providing thought leadership on mitigating the negative effects of COVID-19 on telecommunications businesses owned and operated by members of communities of color. Um, it's examined access to capital for small and diverse broadcasters and partnered with lenders to share methods for obtaining financing for broadcast station transactions and hosted experts to present on the possibility of new tax uh, certificate policy to increase broadcast ownership diversity. And uh, furthermore, it has provided information and resources on obtaining employment in the tech sector to diverse high school and college students, as well as to key influencers such as guidance counselors, placement officers, and parents. The phrase now more than ever, is a bit of a cliche, but the current moment requires it. The work of the ACDDE, now more than ever, is critical. Communities of color are hardest hit by the pandemic and connectivity during the era of social distance, when so many of the places where we live and work are closed, is an issue that sometimes amounts to life or death. The FCC must continue to work to advance its mission, and during this moment must be mindful of how that mission impacts those who are most vulnerable and in greatest need of assistance. That is what the commission has been doing, and I pledge to do everything I can to help it do more. I'm delighted to have been invited to participate, and thank you to all of uh, all of you who have worked hard to make this event happen. Thank you very much, Commissioner Symington. Next, I'd like to turn things over to the three J's. As you know, we have we have phenomenal uh, DFOs and deputy DFOs. So I'd like to introduce uh, Jamila Best Johnson, Julie Sonnier, and Jamil Cadre. But I will first turn it over to Jamila Best Johnson. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning. Good morning, Acting Chairwoman Rosenworcel, Commissioner Starks, and Commissioner Symington. Thank you so much for spending time with us this morning and getting us off to a good start. I wanna thank also everyone who's tuning in today to join us for this meeting, uh, especially the ACDDE members and working group members. Uh, it seems as though we just met in September, just a short while ago, but I think as everyone will hear later today when you all deliver your reports, uh, you all have packed in a lot of punch into your work, into your objectives, and into your going forward mission. So we wanna thank you for that. I, I don't think that people really realize when we're in a forum like this, what goes into your work. Uh, but let me assure you that many of our working groups and our subgroups meet weekly, weekly, uh, and many of our groups meet bi-weekly. So this is, this is not just a meeting where we do our work here. This work is ongoing, it's deliberate, and it's conscientious. And I wanna extend my personal gratitude for all of you who put in the sweat equity to produce the kind of stellar results 
that you all are gonna hear more about later today. And with that, I turn it over to our deputy designated federal officer, Julie Saunier for her welcome remarks. Julie. Good morning, everyone. And I'd also like to thank our acting chair, commissioners, and our media bureau chief, Michelle Carey. And I'd also like to welcome our brand new members who will be introduced more formally later on, but the, I'm welcome to our, our work. You're in for a great ride. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you who have worked so hard on the various symposia, summits, showcases, and many other events that we'll be hearing about today. Once again, I find I'm thanking you for your past work, but I'm also awed by all that you still plan to do. I so enjoy working with you and seeing your spirit of camaraderie and devotion to your mission every day. Godspeed to you all for today's presentations and discussions and the work we have before us for the next four months. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from our deputy designated federal officer, Jamil Cadre. Jamil. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to echo um, first the welcome from my um, colleagues and uh, thank you to Acting Chairwoman Rosenworcel and um, Commissioner Starks and Commissioner Symington. Um, we are delighted to have you here today. Um, and to uh, see your commitment to the work that the committee is doing. Um, and of course, I wanna honor um, our committee members, uh, just true dedication to everything they've been doing. Um, as act the acting chairwoman noted, um, this time has really um, underlined the importance of the work that you are doing. And despite the challenges of the time, you've really continued to meet the moment. Um, as Julie said, you've already done so, so much um, from the events uh, that you've had um, to the work behind the scenes that you've been doing, um, your research and, and just everything. Um, I wanna thank you and it's been a true honor to be working with you through this time. And um, I also want to, I'm very excited to have um, the other working groups see what you've all been doing individually and for you to be able to share with the public tuning in today, everything that you have done. Um, so with special thanks also to our Vice, our chair and our vice chair, our working group chairs, but truly this cannot, none of this could happen without the effort of every single member of the committee. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jamil. And now we're gonna turn the meeting over to our tireless chair and vice chair, Anna Gomez and Heather Gate. Uh, they are leaders not in name only. Anna and Heather attend working group meetings and subgroup meetings, and their sweat equity shows up in all that this committee produces as well. So on behalf of everyone at the FCC and in the committee, we thank Anna and Heather for their dedication. So thank you. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Jamila. <laughs> and thank you to Chairwoman Rosemary Russell and Commissioners Starks and Symington and Michelle Carey uh, for joining us today and giving us your remarks. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for highlighting the importance of the work the ACDD is doing. Uh, your support for the ACDD -E and its mission is noted and much appreciated. Uh, this is our third full ACDD -E meeting during the pandemic. And like many other Americans, we continue to work study and play remotely. And we're lucky because we have access to broadband that enables us to have our meetings, work with the working groups, meet with the stakeholders, meet with the experts. But we are motivated by the knowledge that many people, especially people of color, do not have that same access. And we are motivated by the goal of ensuring a diversity of voices in tech and broadcasting. The ACDDE working groups have really pushed the pedal to the metal as we round our final lap in this ACDDE's chapter. Your working groups will give you a summary of the work they've done since our last meeting, as well as plans for finalizing their work products. I cannot thank enough our working group chairs, Caroline Beasley, Rudy Brioche, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee for their leadership, as well as the subgroup leaders for all their work uh, to get us to this point. 
And much as Michelle said, I thank the intrepid three J's, Jamila Best Johnson, Jamil Cadre, and Julie Saunier. And you are the glue that holds this committee together. And now I would like to turn this over to the amazing vice chair of this committee, Heather Gate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Acting Chairwoman Rosen Russell, Commissioner Starks, and Commissioner Simonson for joining us today and um, just recognizing the importance of the ACDDE. I'd also like to thank Michelle Carey for opening us up, opening the meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank the, our designated federal officers, the three J's, and also uh, fellow committee members other commission staff and members of the public. Thank you again for joining us today during this penultimate meeting of the full committee with our final meeting being scheduled on June 24th. Um, we happen to have scheduled this week meeting during a pivotal, a pivotal week for telecommunications as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the signing of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 which launched an era of broadband advancement and digital inclusion. And during the time of the signing, this act was described as revolutionary and enabling an, an age of possibility in America to expand, to include more Americans. And indeed, we have made tremendous strides since then. We have seen the best of human ingenuity, economic opportunity, education, a better quality of life, at the same time, along that way, we have also recognized the existence of a persistent digital divide and the importance of focused policy and programmatic interventions that allow us to bridge that digital divide. And this digital divide is further exacerbated by uh, the pandemic of the past year. Diverse committees such as this ACDDE play such a pivotal role in ensuring that historically disenfranchised communities, low-income communities, women, the LGBTQ community, and other minority groups are represented in policy decisions and priorities that these groups often sometimes find themselves at the wrong side of the digital divide with limited opportunities to join and advance in technology and communication sector. As Chairwoman Rosenworcel stated, the lack of diversity is a barrier to innovation, and we have data that shows that. So today, our working group will talk about the, the milestones of the last five months and the road to delivery of our final recommendations and reports to the FCC in June. Um, this committee, in partnership with FCC and other organizations, have brought together a diverse group of subject matter experts and members of the public to examine broadband adaption challenges, particularly for libraries and community anchor institutions and best practices that can make us even more effective and better at bridging the digital divide. And we've also explored opportunities for moving the needle for diverse and women-owned businesses to, to help in diversify the tech and the communication sector. As again, Commissioner, uh, Chairwoman uh, Rosenwasser said, exposure to inventors and, and entrepreneurs is great for children. And just a month ago, we had a great symposium where we brought together high school and college students to listen and learn from people and entrepreneurs and, and leaders in the tech sector. So I would like to end my comments by again thanking the committee members led by the subgroup chairs and the working group chairs who have done tremendous work in, in putting together all these discussions over the past year. I, I look forward to you all learning about all the amazing work that they've done and what they will be delivering in June. So again, thank you all for joining us today. So I'd like to hand it over back to Anna and say, let's get to work. Thank you, Heather. As always, you provide such wonderful substance and expertise to this committee. Um, I see that Commissioner Carr has joined us, uh, so I'd like to turn it over to him uh, to give us a few remarks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Uh, well, thank you so much to uh, this distinguished group for the chance to 
say hello and really first and foremost express my personal gratitude for your contributions. I've gotten to know a lot of you over the years in my time at the commission, before my time at the commission as well. Uh, and I know that you all are gonna put together some um, really fantastic recommendations so we can continue to make progress on what are some of the most critical issues that we face uh, at the FCC. As always, I wanna thank you for doing this outside of your normal jobs and obligations you have, particularly uh, in this pandemic time that we're in, everybody has so much going on, uh, whether it's taking care of kids, parents, uh, checking up on uh, neighbors. So there's so much going on in our lives. The fact that you all are taking this added responsibility uh, to me speaks volume to how important it is that we make progress on these issues. Because I, I think all of us know from our own personal lives uh, the power of a connection and how um, everywhere in this country there is so much potential and increasingly, you have to be online uh, to truly realize that potential. And I saw this for myself. I was down at the uh, Mescalero Apache Reservation uh, in New Mexico and went to the Mescalero Apache School and met a young woman there uh, named Lana. And she was in the school's STEM program. And they have a robust, thriving STEM education program uh, right there at the Mescalero Apache School, thanks to an internet connection uh, that brings that opportunity there. And she showed me a, uh, a ro robot that she had already coded, uh, and it was just a phenomenal experience. You take someone like that um, with an internet connection, uh, introduce them to the STEM field, uh, and the possibilities at that point are then endless. And so for me, that's one of the most important jobs we have at the commission. How do we make sure that everyone in this country has a connection? How do we make sure that it is accessible uh, once that connection is there so that everyone can actually get online and use the internet. Um, and, and that's got to be one of our uh, most important goals. Thankfully, I think it's one that we all agree on. Uh, it's a bipartisan goal. And I look forward to the recommendations that you all will make so that we can keep making progress on that. So thank you again for all the work that you're doing on this committee. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Uh, we appreciate your support as well. Um, with that, I will uh, formally call this meeting to order. So first, we will take our roll call. As I call your name, please unmute yourself and let us know that you're on. Raul Alarcon. Susan Allen. Present. Laura Barakal. Present. Caroline Beasley. Here. Cindy Benavides. Sydney, I know you Cindy, I know you're on. Shelly Blakeney. Present. Maria Brennan. Rudy Brioche. Present. Kareen Contractor. I'm, here, I'm right here. Skip Dillard. I'm present. Awesome. Michelle Duke. Deborah Elam. I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Marita Coley. Good morning, present. Good morning. Dr. Dominique Harrison, one of our new members. Rashidi Hendricks. Present. David Honig. I know he's on the phone. Hi, David. Hello. Dr. Ron Johnson. Present. Sherman Kizart. Roy Litland. Present. Duwan McCoy. Present. Sean Perryman. Henry Rivera. 
I'm here. Steve Roberts. Good morning, present. Brian Scarpelli. I'm here. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Mimisha Shukla, Dr. Shukla. S. Janelle Trigg. Good morning, present. Good morning. Dr. Nicole Turner Lee. Present. James Winston. Present. Good morning. Good morning. Chris Wood. Good morning, present. Good morning. And I've got our working group members as well. Uh, and one of our new members, Robert Brooks. Present. Welcome. Milton Clipper. Good morning, present. Morning. Rosa Mendoza Davila. Here. Cecilia Gordon. Cecilia is also one of our new members. Garrett Comrade. Uh, Anna, she's Present. running late. She just sent me a text. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Garrett, was that you? Yes, I'm present. Nahuja? Alma Nahuja? Present. Good morning. Morning. And another one of our new members, Dr. Allison Scott. Good morning and present. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Ian Skorodin. Hi, Anna, I'm here. Hello. Felicia West. Good morning, present. Good morning. And last but not least, Dr. Fallon Wilson. Present. Thank you. Have I missed anyone? All right, thank you, everybody. So um, let's move on to our working group uh, presentations. Rudy Brioche will lead our first working group, the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group presentation. Rudy, I pass this on to you. Hi, great. Can you hear me? Is everything okay on my, on your end? Yes. Yes. Fabulous. Thanks. Hi. Uh, good morning. And boy, what a lineup we had um, uh, to have uh, the various commissioners, uh, the acting chairwoman uh, to present to the working group uh, is not only historic, uh, but it's also um, groundbreaking in the sense that she mentioned Shirley Chisholm, who is very close and dear to, uh, to me, because uh, she represented the uh, 12th Congressional District of Brooklyn, um, and that's my uh, home and uh, birthplace. Um, and to start off a conversation at these times um, that uh, echoes the, you know, the uh, historical work of um, Shirley Chisholm uh, speaks a lot to the moment we're in today. Uh, this working group in particular has been, uh, you know, part of moving the overall advisory committee uh, to a point for us to respond to the actions of today, what is currently happening. So we're going to go through the work that we've been doing, and a lot of our work has been informed and uh, affected by the COVID pandemic. It is important to note, however, that the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group is proud of the fact that we actually led the advisory committee's work in adopting a powerful statement uh, several months ago that reaffirmed our commitment to assist the commission in its effort to expand digital equity and empower diverse communities to spur educational, economic, uh, and civic development. We're proud of that work and we're gonna continue that. So today we're gonna go through all the work that we've been doing for the many months um, and uh, the working group itself is a working group that is made up of a diverse group of stakeholders, not only folks from industry, uh, but from state, local government, civic society, and that also includes the tribal community as well. So I'm proud to 
please go through the names of our various um, working group chairs. Do we have the slides? Coming out. Coming out. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, well, in the meantime, let me just uh, just go through uh, the names of the various members that we're going to um, w walk through. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that the work that we're doing uh, is uh, work that really requires a lot of people to be part of the process. So although I'll mention the names of the people who are at the forefront, um, but we have engaged a great deal of number of stakeholders, uh, and they've helped us throughout the process, and we'll highlight you know, some of those engagements. But our working group is divided into two subgroups. The first is the digital inclusion subgroup, and that's head by Harine Contractor uh, with the uh, with the Joint Center and Laura Burrico from, uh, from our Charter Communications. And then the other part of our uh, working group, the next subgroup is the digital empowerment subgroup. Uh, and the co-leads there are uh, Susan Allen, um, and uh, as Janelle Trigg, and we'll talk more in detail about their work uh, at the second half of our presentation. And we have our at-large members, you know, Sydney Benavidez, uh, Shelley Blakely, uh, Roy Littman, Ian Zorokin, and uh, Felicia West. I'd like to pause for a moment to give you an opportunity for our two new members uh, to introduce themselves to the broader working group um uh one person and we'll go with the ladies first uh, is it new to this working group uh she's been actively involved in doing a great deal of work for the working group but now she's actually formally the actual person who represents her company team mobile shelly blakely is a part of the technology and engineering policy group at uh, t mobile shelly if you're on would love for you to say hello to the uh to the advisory group Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, Shelly Blakely here. I'm with T-Mobile's Government Affairs Department, and I've been with the company for uh, several years now, and I primarily focus on issues involving consumer protection and public safety. I am very excited and pleased to have the opportunity to continue um, my work here with this distinguished group and uh, we'll continue working on these important issues. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you very much, Shelley. Uh, our new member uh, is uh, Ian Sorokin. Uh, Ian is really a special member because we've been looking at tribal libraries uh, and their role in facilitating uh, you know, broadband adoption. Ian come to us as a subject matter expert. He's a member of the Choctaw uh, nation of Oklahoma. He's also the director of strategy for the Native American Media Alliance and CEO of Varsid Foundation. Ian? Uh, thank you. Um, I am truly excited to be a part of this working group. Um, having only been involved a short time, I am very impressed with the amount of dedication there has been to diversity overall and specifically to tribal adoption. Uh, my greatest hope is that my time with the working group, I will be able to utilize my background to provide new perspective that will propel the opportunities available to Native American communities. Um, as of now, uh, the Native American community faces numerous obstacles, but things, things seem optimistic. While not optimal, uh, they are optimistic. Uh, through the Barca Foundation, uh, for the past 17 years, um, I have worked closely with diversity and inclusion departments, corporate social responsibility personnel, and government affairs within networks, studios, and other entities within the entertainment industry. Our goal is to ensure that our community's voice be included in writers' rooms for television series, productions for motion pictures, and the newest animation streaming online. Sharing our perspective through mainstream media is one of the best ways to garner more understanding of who our community really is. In addition to providing workforce development training, creative labs, and annual arts events throughout the year, we, have a, we provide a robust STEM program for Native youth on reservations throughout the U.S., and we are currently overseeing a COVID-19 relief fund for Native Americans in the entertainment industry. Again, I am honored to be part of the working group and look forward to contributing to the great things to come. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ian. I really look forward to your expertise, and in this very short time you've been with us, you've added uh, significant value. 
Uh, I'd like to go back and at least uh, provide the various affiliations of um, some of our other uh, members. Um, Sydney Benavidez is with uh, LULAC. Uh, Roy Litton is, uh, Litlin is with uh, Verizon. Um, Felicia West is with the Washington, D.C. Uh, Public Service Commission. Uh, and uh, our two co-leads of the digital empowerment uh, subgroup, um, you know, Susan Allen is with the U.S. Uh, Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce, and uh, S. Janelle Trigg is with Learning Center Law Firm. So uh, we will uh, move on to our working groups. First, we'll uh, deal with the digital inclusion subgroup and then uh, the digital empowerment. Now, for digital inclusion, uh, digital inclusion is really broadband adoption. Um, let me kind of give just very briefly the kind of broad uh, goals of the working group and then give you a sense of why we are focusing on the, on the particular subjects that we're focusing on. Very broadly, our goals are to identify barriers. And these are to identify barriers to adoption uh, of um, you know, advanced communication uh, technologies um, particularly when it comes to diverse and economically disadvantaged communities. And we're also looking to develop mechanisms to ensure that these diverse um, and uh, economically disadvantaged communities are not denied these wide range of, um, of uh, benefits uh, that uh, the acting chairwoman talked about, educational opportunities, economic opportunities, healthcare, civic participation, et cetera. The way we've broken it down is when it comes to the uh, digital inclusion part, we're focusing on broadband adoption and use. And that's intentional. We want to examine the human aspect of the digital divide and to assess the strategies that are currently in place to overcome these barriers to adoption and uh, use of broadband, not just broadband, other advanced communication technologies as well. All that impact uh, diverse and economically disadvantaged communities, and that is our area of focus. Broadband adoption in particular is important because we're building on the work that's been previously done uh, by earlier iterations of this working group. Uh, our current vice chair, uh, Heather Gates, is uh, the chair of this uh, very uh, working group. And then we actually focused on the uh, deployment of broadband. This iteration, we're focusing very specifically on broadband adoption. Uh, in the policy discussion, uh, deployment uh, is usually the, the focus. We think that uh, focusing on broadband adoption is important and it is responsive uh, to the charter uh, and the charge that we were given by the FCC. According to most statistics, about 85% of US households subscribe to an internet and broadband. Um, but uh, you know, 73% of U.S. households subscribe to a uh, fixed uh, uh, broadband uh, connection. Focusing on libraries as an anchor institution and as a driver for broadband adoption allows us to examine the broader challenges uh, and also the opportunities confronting diverse communities. But we wanted to look at it from the perspective of one of the key stakeholders in this discussion, and we believe that U.S. libraries both U.S. libraries um, servicing uh, diverse communities writ large are important, but also libraries that are focused that focus on uh, tribal communities as uh, well. So the first part of our uh, of our working group focuses on both of those uh, aspects because we think focusing on library services to the general population and to the tribal community uh, is important. Fortunately for us, uh, we've had two um, you know, very dedicated co-chairs who've been willing to put a lot of time and effort into our work plan. I won't steal any of the thunder, but we've done a lot of work. We've had a number of uh, workshops uh, to really get a lot of good information from many stakeholders. And we've reached out to both the private sector and uh, to the library and non um, uh, uh, and the public sector as, as well. Our work will continue, but let me stop here and turn to our two co-chairs, uh, to Harreen Contractor and uh, Laura Burkle, who will go through the work that we've done uh, on this part of our uh, efforts regarding broadband uh, adoption. So let me first turn to Harreen, and Harreen will kick things off for us. Harreen? 
Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Don't know why there's an echo. echo. Sorry, Sorry, maybe someone needs to mute themselves. All right, everyone muted. Fantastic. All right, we've done a lot of great work in this committee, uh, but we want to be very action oriented. So building off our workshop we did in September, where we brought together library communities and adoption partners, where we had a robust conversation on potentially challenges and solutions to bridge this divide, you know, enabling these anchor institutions to continue to deliver the vital services to their communities, particularly opportunity communities, was a very insightful one. And building off that workshop, we wanted to continue some of those conversations. So after we left the very productive conversation where we talked about some of the unique aspects that, that libraries do and partnerships, uh, partners can do, we had subsequent conversations with public sector partners, library associations, and the private sector to explore a little bit more of what we started in September. So we, we had a more in-depth conversation with Girls Who Code. Again, one of the most robust organizations out there trying to attract women into STEM. They have a vast amount of resources. They do a lot of partnerships. They're one of the leading organizations in this space. And we want to dial a little bit more about their work within libraries and how they can work with different groups together to move the adoption needle. We also talked with Google and their Grow with Google initiative and what they've done with libraries and different communities. You know, how they come in there, they do a train the trainer model. We want to understand a little bit more about what has worked well, what is not, uh, and, and getting the understanding there. We had a cross conversation with the After School Alliance and the Association of Rural and Small Libraries to have an understanding and a frank discussion between libraries and partners themselves because Sometimes when you have conversations in silos, libraries say one thing, partners say another, but no, some folks aren't really talking together, talking past each other. So I wanted to bring those groups together to see where there were ways they can work together and where the common challenges were and what they felt were common solutions. And that was very productive. We also did another call with Microsoft. They do a lot of robust adoption of efforts as well. We wanted to see where they were focusing their energy and then what, again, where were they falling short potentially? And so, we also met with a bunch of tribal um, community pieces. There's a lot of complexity issues here. I'll let Laura talk about that. I didn't want to take too much time because there's a lot of good work and conversation going on, but we've been busy to say the least uh, since our September conversation, diving in uh, layer lower to see what is actually going on and provide some concrete recommendations. We're not going to give that away just yet. I'll talk a little bit more about some of that later in this conversation but I'm not gonna give away uh, and spoil the surprise. So I'll let Laura talk about what we've done in the tribal, sent, uh, tribal piece since September. Thank you, Harreen. I love your energy. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to also thank our committee leadership, including our esteemed chair, Anna Gomez, vice chair, Heather Gates, and our DEI working group chair, of course, Rudy Brioche for your remarks earlier. Um, and big thanks to, to Acting Chairwoman Rosen Warsaw, as well as the commissioners, all of them who, who uh, delivered remarks today and took time today to join the ACDDE uh, for, for our discussion. That is a mouthful, I agree with Anna. <laughs> um, I also want to know, I especially appreciate Commissioner Carr's mention of the digital inclusion efforts happening in tribal schools in New Mexico, including the success of STEM and robotic programs, we agree that ensuring broadband connectivity um, and adoption in tribal communities is critical. And in fact, it's part of the work that we're doing within this subgroup. Um, so another component of the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group uh, research is really to examine the role of libraries on broadband adoption and literacy in tribal communities. So similar to public libraries, tribal libraries have a primary mission to serve the information needs of their community, this includes providing access to computers, internet, connectivity, digital, digital literacy training. Um, however, in addition to helping advance digital inclusion, tribal libraries can also serve as uh, what we've heard um, called culture keepers for tribal information and history. And this really makes these libraries much more unique. Um, and they, they're institutions that uniquely um, impact tribal communities. So today our working group has held meetings. Um, we've held meetings with the chief of the FCC's Office of Native Affairs and Policy, known as ONAP, uh, the chief there, Matthew Duchenne, as well as members of his team. We've also met with tribal expert and former tribal liaison for USAC, the Universal Service Administrative Company. 
Uh, her name is Mackenzie Howard. So through these meetings, we were able to identify the E-rate program as the key federal program available to tribal libraries to support broadband adoption and digital skilling needs. ONAP um, and their engagement with tribal libraries is really centered on the E-rate program and working collaboratively with USAC to share program information with tribal communities and libraries. So opportunities for greater coordination between ONAP and USAC were discussed um, with tribal expert Mackenzie Howard, formerly with USAC, uh, who's had firsthand experience um, with the tribal communities and libraries. Um, this is an area that we plan to dig a little deeper in the coming months through our working groups, meetings with tribal experts, as well as meetings with experts from our general library track, which includes uh, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, IMLS, Arizona State Library and uh, the American Library Association. The working group has obtained several reports and studies that share information and data related to the challenges concerning broadband adoption in tribal communities, as well as opportunities to improve the role that libraries can play in advancing digital inclusion and equity. So these studies are currently under review and we will be, um, and they will be used actually to help inform the working group's research and analysis on tribal libraries. Uh, so that's kind of a little recap of what we've done since our last meeting. Um, at this time, I'd, I'd like to turn the conversation over to my colleagues, Shelly Blakeney and Roy Litland to share some updates related to our working group's engagement uh, and discussions with the tech staff. Hey, this is Roy Litland. Thank you very much, Laura. So we we held the August 2020 workshop uh, featuring experts from libraries, academia, and civil society organizations to discuss efforts regarding broadband adoption and literacy. We wanted to also another important piece with what the providers are doing, and so we we drafted a questionnaire regarding the providers' efforts in the space. We worked with the designated federal officer Jamila Best Johnson to obtain the necessary the necessary approvals within the FCC. The questionnaire we drafted had five questions relating to broadband adoption and literacy efforts. Uh, one of the questions focused on new or modified broadband adoption efforts uh, or, and, and programs in response to COVID-19. Another question focused on top programs or initiatives promoting broadband adoption or literacy, especially any focusing on STEM, libraries, schools, or public-private partnerships. Um, and a couple questions focused on where there were partnerships. How did the company identify library schools or other organizations that the company works with? And what's the primary benefit of working with those select partners? And then we had a catch-all question giving, giving the, the providers an, an opportunity to, uh, to address any sort of lessons learned, uh, positive or negative. We sent the questionnaire initially back uh, to six companies, Charter, Comcast, Google, Microsoft, T-Mobile, and Verizon. We, we, we limited the survey to this to this small number because anything much larger could have triggered paperwork production act processes that, that we didn't have time for um we said the questionnaire was sent by the media bureau uh back in november asking for responses by december um and then in mid-january actually we, we did uh, we did send it uh, through the media bureau to one additional company at and uh, we received responses in december from five of the six companies um uh, a, a subset of di working group members had talked to google already in early November around the same time. So we didn't ask, we didn't necessarily ask them for written responses because we had gotten that through the conversation. The responses from the companies ranged from three to five pages. And, and uh, Shelley Blakeney uh, will discuss the responses in the, in the information the working group received in this, in this conversation with uh, Google. Shelley. Thank you, Roy. Based on the survey responses we received from providers, um, about their initiatives. Some of the overarching themes that we observed involved providing free or reduced cost connectivity and devices to students, school districts, and individuals left behind by the digital divide, providing additional deployment support for school districts, providing free hotspot internet access as safe spaces or to the broader public, and providing or supporting programs that focus on digital literacy and employment skills. In addition, many of these efforts are done through partnerships with community organizations and public institutions, such as libraries. These providers committed to F the FCC's Keep Americans Connected pledge while it was in effect, and some providers made similar pledges beyond this initiative. 
Many of the initiatives included in the survey responses actually predated the pandemic, but in response to the, the pandemic, several of these providers bolstered their existing initiatives and, and implemented new ones. Our survey respondents, which Ray mentioned earlier, are doing great work. And while we cannot share all of their endeavors on today's call, I'll mention a single program from each of you of, from each to give you a sense of their work. So going in alphabetical order, uh, starting with Charter, Charter has a program called the Spectrum Digital Education Program, where they award grants to not for profit community organizations that educate people on the benefits of broadband and how to use it to improve their lives. Grants provide laptops and computers, digital education classes, and technology labs that they have helped increase digital literacy for thousands across Charter's footprint. Comcast. Comcast Internet Essentials Program is structured as a partnership between Comcast and tens of thousands of school districts, libraries, and elected officials, as well as nonprofit community organizations. Launched in 2011, Internet Essentials is structured to make broadband internet service available to low-income families, as well as provide low-cost computers and free digital training. Since the program's ince inception in 2011, Internet Essentials has connected more than 2 million U.S. households, serving approximately 8 million people to the internet. Google, um, you heard mentioned earlier, Google has a program, Grow with Google, with offers um, a free training and tools to help people grow their skills um, for their career or business. Microsoft's U.S. Airband program allows the company to partner with rural internet service providers, lending technical expertise and other support to get more rural Americans connected faster. Through partnerships, Microsoft committed to extending broadband access to at least 3 million Americans living in rural areas by July 2022. T-Mobile. T-Mobile launched an unprecedented $10.7 billion initiative called Project 10 Million, aimed at delivering internet connectivity to millions of underserved student households at no cost to them. Partnering with various school districts ac across the country, the program offers free wireless hotspots, free high-speed data, and access to laptops and tablets at, at cost. And finally, Verizon. Verizon's innovative learning program provides free technology, free internet access, teacher training, and a technology-infused learning curriculum to under-resourced Title I middle schools across the country. To date, close to 265 schools have participated in the program since 2014, and Verizon has plans to reach 350 schools by the end of 2021. In addition, Verizon, through its digital literacy and skills training, recently committed to provide 10 million youth with digital access and skills training by the year of 2030. This concludes my discussion. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley and Roy. Um, appreciate the comments. I'd like to take some time now to walk through next steps related to the digital inclusion subgroups work plans from now to the end of the current charter, which I believe is July 5th. So we heard from Shelley and Roy regarding the industry survey results uh, and our plans to incorporate our findings in our working group's final broadband paper. Um, in addition, an additional step actually in our work plan includes compiling additional research findings of the work that's being done to advance broadband adoption in tribal communities. Uh, our interest in exploring tribal libraries is really to learn more about the capacity of tribal libraries to drive digital inclusion activities for tribal communities. Uh, to date, our research efforts have revealed a range of challenges as well as a few bright spots. Um, so I think now is a good time to just uh, walk through some of our key observations related to tribal libraries. Uh, so I'll start just by, I guess, mentioning the obvious. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly had a disproportionate impact on tribal communities, and it's really made recovery efforts um, for libraries more difficult, as it has done for, for you know, the rest of the country as well. 
Uh, last year, Arizona State University's American Indian Policy Institute actually released a COVID-19 report addressing broadband availability, availability and adoption challenges that exist in tribal areas, noting that, quote, Indian country continues to lag behind the rest of the U.S. in terms of access to high-speed home internet service, end quote. So while tribal libraries are part of the U.S. library ecosystem, they function very differently than public libraries and as a result face different challenges, particularly in today's COVID environment. Uh, so one thing is that tribes must be federally recognized in order to qualify for federal programs like E-rate. So in some cases, there can be confusion among tribal libraries regarding their federally recognized status, which can obviously cause confusion about program eligibility. Uh, for tribal libraries that are eligible for programs like E-rate, the goal that we see is to find the best path um, and process for securing good outcomes for them. So we found that strong state E-rate coordination is critical to achieve this. Tribal heavy states that have strong E-rate coordinators tend to be more successful at securing positive incomes for tribal libraries within their state. So in addition, strong partnerships between organizations, for example, USAC, ONAP, and E-rate administrators uh, also tend to yield better income or outcomes, I should say, for tribal communities uh, and successful enrollment in E-rate and other USAC programs. However, the makeup of tribal libraries also plays a critical factor in program eligibility and success. Uh, some of these tribal libraries deal with uh, turnover. High turnover is a problem for some of these libraries, as is unfamiliarity with E-rate and other USAC programs, which also results in low interest in program participation. So opportunities to enhance relationship building and trust within tribal communities can go a long way. For example, having USAC work more closely alongside tribal community partners to build more support, cultivate tribal voices and advocates that, and these individuals can then help advocate on behalf of USAC among tribal libraries, which may help in increasing interest in the E-rate program. Additional barriers can include tribal challenges in securing broadband connectivity, which may impact program availability for some tribal libraries. For example, if a community is completely unserved. Uh, there's so much information um, <laughs> to kind of go through. So this is my, my super compressed version of our working group's initial observations related to tribal libraries. During the remainder of our charter, our working group's goal is to help create a glide path and identify areas that can enhance the role that tribal libraries play in supporting and meeting the digital needs of, of tribal communities. So through additional discussions with tribal experts over the next couple of months, we plan to secure additional perspectives regarding how broadband adoption plays into the work of tribal libraries. So with that said, I'd like to hand it off to my fellow working group member, Ian Skorodin, to discuss some positive use cases uh, related to the work of tribal libraries um, and efforts that we have found to be successful in better supporting technology access and adoption in tribal communities. Ian, I hand it off to you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, to put some specificity on the need for greater tribal adoption, um, I can provide insight based on personal experience. Um, our organization, the Barset Foundation, works closely with the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe tucked in the corner of Southwest Colorado and Southeastern Utah. Having worked with them since 2015, I have seen their access to internet increase in, in increments um, over the past few years. Uh, they recently built a new tower in their area that has boosted their signal and just in time as the pandemic shut down their employees ability to go to work their students ability to go to school and the tribe's ability to function normally but having grown their wi-fi capability they managed to keep operations running and kids maintain their lessons um, this is one of the many examples across tribal communities that have benefited from the expansion of broadband however uh, there is always room for improvement on the Ute Mountain Reservation, many homes in the area are still considered underserved with less than minimum speeds, and they continue to seek additional aid to increase broadband as people continue to work from home due to the pandemic. This includes tribal entrepreneurs, tribal educators, and day-to-day -day tribal business. Everyone is using the current broadband available, leaving little available. So just like everyone else, 
as has been mentioned, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely made it more challenging for tribal nations. Uh, but looking at what can work, uh, New Mexico is a state containing tribal areas that have found avenues to overcome access issues and has been able to move forward with fostering greater digital inclusion and adoption efforts. Uh, one example of success of adoption is with a consortium of New Mexico tribal schools and Pueblo tribal communities that came together to acquire broadband services. You know, and uh, one aspect that makes New Mexico unique is the state and federal legislators' familiarity with their constituencies' needs, and at the same time, knowledge of, a pro of programs like E-Rate. Uh, specifically, uh, specifically um, Senator Ben Ray Lujan has been an advocate and has made a difference for tribes in New Mexico. Uh, the importance of congressional advocacy and support to advance tribal broadband adoption objectives and goals is paramount to moving the needle forward for tribal communities giving them a voice where they normally just wouldn't have one. Uh, beyond that, uh, drivers for adoption can arise from other tribal needs. Uh, for example, uh, distance learning opportunities for communities that are isolated. Typically, tribal communities are located in rural and remote areas. Another driver for adoption is language preservation efforts. Last fluent speakers of tribal languages within Native communities are passing away at a high rate currently, leaving tribes without a large piece of their history. So uh, tribal broadband adoption is and will remain a very important topic uh, going forward to address uh, within the Native American community. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ian. Um, I think that we might be a little tired of talking, so I'd like to turn the conversation over to my esteemed co-lead, Harine Contractor, to discuss next steps associated uh, with deadlines related to our working group's final broadband adoption report, as well as some of our working group's preliminary report findings and observations. So, Harine. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. It's been a pleasure working with you in particular and, and Rudy. Uh, if For those who don't know, Laura is balancing three children at home while working a full day job while leading this effort. Uh, and she does a phenomenal job. So has a, a lot of people are facing a lot of challenges. And she's no different, but she's handling it very well. So thank you for all your hard work. So I'm going to touch upon a little bit of where we're going and our objectives, our object, uh, objectives. So as previously stated, you know, we set out to explore the importance of libraries as they as a role they play as anchor institution in communities. We all know libraries are a gateway for many things for people, whether it's literacy, length access, training, and career services. Libraries are a driver of digital inclusion and adoption and have been, but for a lot of reasons, structurally, market failures, they're not meeting their potential, right? And our work was trying to explore how we could amplify their work and connect to this the work of the vital institution. That's what we started off doing. And then COVID happened right at the beginning of our efforts. Libraries had to shut down. They had to adapt how they provide access during a time of social distancing and where million, millions lacked access where they needed it more than ever. And so what did they do? They adapted, they shifted their operations, but they're still facing the challenge of additional budget cuts from state and local governments right now because their revenues have collapsed in the recession. But libraries try to find a way, but they need a little help. So our work is that much more important. It was clear from our discussions at the symposium, the panels and the interviews, how important these library communities are to local communities and opportunity communities. The bottom line here is libraries want someone else to figure out the access piece so they can focus on the adoption piece. That's one thing we heard time and time again, and you'll find that in our final recommendation report. That is their competitive advantage. They wanna focus on adoption. And while we will go into more detail on recommendations for the commission, our final report, there are some areas of focus that are revolve around the need for better interagency coordination of digital of the digital skills lifecycle. So from build out to training, because it's not just about providing access, it's about what you do with it after it's done, right? So coordination of public private partnerships is something else we're going to talk about. You heard a lot about that today. We're going to further go into that. Using the bully pulpit of the FCC, I'm glad they're building efforts to make websites to create awareness, but the full, full power of the FCC to encourage NGOs, telecom, got state and local governments to better coordinate their efforts to encourage libraries to share and amplify their resources is an extremely important. Potentially organizing and convening along with IMLS to encourage more E-rate take up for libraries or better coordination 
is something that is essential. So as we start to rebuild from this pandemic that's raged, particularly communities of color, many students, workers, and families are hurting. They're on the sidelines, right? Mothers in particular and women have dropped out of the labor force at record numbers. How are we going to get them back? How are we going to get communities of color who've been ravaged uh, to come back? My son this morning, he does virtual kindergarten. A lot of his fellow classmates, six-year-olds are home by themselves because their parents are essential workers. And they're trying to balance how to do homework while trying to balance what is available to them virtually. It's a tough situation. I'm fortunate and privileged enough to be there with him. And so is my wife, but others are not in the same situation. Libraries are an outlet for support, but they're facing dire financial situations. Pooling and channeling resources together is more important than ever. It is imperative that we uplift and amplify the work of these vital anchor institutions. Our, our committee will continue to monitor and support successful rollouts of the emergency broadband benefit and monitor other potential legislation and stimulus efforts that impact digital adoption. So you'll see, here, you'll see and hear more from us in the coming months. My fellow working group members are going to get their hands dirty on this report, and we hope to provide something that's important, concrete, and actionable when we deliver our final report in July. So thank you for your time and back to our esteemed leader, Rudy. Irene, thank you so much. Um, as everyone can see, there's a lot of work that's been going into this and um, uh, and uh, the presentation from the working group shows that, you know, there are many aspects of this. So just for a quick recap, we'd like to open it up for questions, but we are examining, you know, broadband adoption from the standpoint. Hi, can others mute please? Can everybody mute their microphones? Thank you. Um, we are looking at this from the, uh, from, uh, from the standpoint of using libraries as uh, our focal point, but we are examining the broader uh, you know, public-private partnership uh, um, you know, and the broadband life cycle that uh, Harin referenced. Uh, we're also looking at the private sector to see specifically the type of programs that they're doing, because that is an area of, of importance. Um, but as we're actually building this, we recognize that things are shifting. Um, not only are we in a pandemic, uh, we're also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, dealing with racial strife, racial equity matters as well. That's having an impact as far as how companies respond, uh, as in terms of expectations as well. Um, and the government, uh, the government's activities are very important. Not only is there increased funding, um, uh, particularly uh, you know, COVID funding from the federal government, but also the FCC, as far as how it's going to operationalize that, uh, and, and, and NTIA, both of those agencies are having workshops. The FCC is having their workshop on the emergency broadband uh, benefits program tomorrow. Uh, NTIA is uh, having a, a, a workshop uh, on the tribal uh, broadband adoption component uh, as well. Um, so we're continuing to monitor these, uh, you know, uh, these areas. You know, so in many ways, we're building this, you know, particular uh, vehicle, recognizing that it's moving uh, and things are changing and expectations are shifting as well. Uh, and we want to deliver a report that is responsive, uh, that is also timely. So with that, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, but before we do that, uh, any other comments from any members of the working group? Um, because as much as we've had our leaders who've talked about this, this is really an all hands affair. So if there are any others uh, who would like to make comments, uh, please make comments now. And if there aren't any additional comments, we'll turn to, um, you know, to a Q&A session. So please, uh, any questions or any additional remarks? Um, this, this is Fallon, and I just wanted to say um, I'm very excited that one of your recommendations is, is likely to be that libraries should not have to focus on the affordability piece and really just focus on adoption. Um, I think that would take additional weight off the work and the tremendous many multi-services that many of our libraries are engaged in, especially when it comes to communities of color. So really excited about that finding. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. Appreciate that. Any other comments? Uh, just, to, uh, just to build on that, that was actually one of the dominant themes of the uh, symposium we had uh, during the summer, uh, where there was a lot of concern around, you know, the libraries are forced to focus on access issues while instead they truly want to work 
uh, and develop innovative programs. Uh, one of the more innovative programs uh, that we heard about was uh, a program to actually help families archive their digital lives. I mean, we develop so much information, so many pictures, and we have uh, pictures scattered on multiple devices, uh, different forms of uh, your media platforms, um, including, you know, you know, tapes, you know, DVDs, uh, et cetera. Um, and I imagine many of us, you know, still have some mixtapes from back in the day as, as, as well, um, and photo albums. How do you actually archive your digital life is really a challenge. But as people get interested in that, that's a way for them to actually adopt, uh, you know, various forms of uh, broadband and advanced technologies as well. So uh, I thought that that was one of the more innovative programs that libraries would just love to develop. And there are other things, you know, whether it's your know, cooking shows or it's, uh, you know, English as a second language courses. These are, uh, you know, like these are programs that are responding to a specific need and in addressing that need that helps that particular community adopt advanced technology, adopt broadband at home uh, in a very effective and meaningful way. So we think libraries have great potential and they want to focus on that and not get distracted with uh, the more broader issues around access, which again, uh, that's an area that they would prefer to not have to be involved in. Uh, any other comments or questions before we turn to the next uh, working group to stay on schedule? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue on this, and if there's any uh, you know, additional uh, questions or comments from people, please do let us know so we can continue to, uh, to work in that area. Uh, the next group uh, is um, uh, is uh, our uh, is our uh, diversity supplier initiative. Um, you know, we view digital empowerment uh, in the form of how are we going to empower uh, you know, diverse communities. And one way to empower diverse communities is economic development. Uh, and as we know, the greatest source of economic development are small businesses. Um, and at the same time, small businesses uh, experience, especially small businesses that are owned by, you know, diverse and, uh, you know, women owners, um, as we call them, diverse communication businesses, those businesses are again dealing with real-time matters. They too are dealing with racial equity issues, access to capital. They are also experiencing, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic and that impact on their lives. Um, and as uh, Acting Chairwoman Rosewall also said, finding ways to mitigate that impact is important. And we think that we're actually helping in that regard. So uh, the two um, uh, co-leads who are leading this uh, uh, effort our two dynamic co-leads, I should say, who are leading, uh, leading this effort uh, are S. Janelle Trigg and Susan Allen, um, who actually need no introduction at all. So, <laughs> Janelle, take it away. Thank you, Rudy, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I personally and professionally appreciate your leadership, so thank you. Uh, as Rudy said, my name is S. Janelle Trigg, and I'm a member of Lerman Center with the Washington-based uh, Communications Law Boutique, and I'm proud to represent the Wireless Internet Association, uh, excuse me, Wireless Internet Service Providers Association on this committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my uh, incomparable co-lead, Susan A. Allen. Susan? Susan is the National President and CEO of the U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce. So be, on behalf of the Digital Empowerment Subgroup uh, and our Great Planning Committee, Susan and I proudly present uh, our work completed since our last public meeting and our summary for our upcoming FCC Technology Supplier Diversity Opportunity Symposium on Wednesday, April the 28th. Please mark that date, April the 28th. That's a Wednesday. Now this spring symposium builds on the success of the FCC Technology Supplier Diversity Opportunity Showcase held on October the 23rd. And that success was only possible with the support of our great planning committee, which includes members of both our uh, digital empowerment 
and inclusion working group, as well as the diversity and tech sector working group led by Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, my dear friend. Uh, our partnership with the diversity and tech working group has been simply wonderful. Uh, our missions have great synergy uh, and we share dedication to helping, as Rudy said, DCBs succeed. I'd like to acknowledge the members of our planning committee, uh, Rudy Rioche, of course, Cindy Benavides with LULEC, Shelly Blakeney, T-Mobile USA, Roy Litlin with Verizon, Ian Skorodin with Varsit Foundation, and the members of the Diversity and Tech uh, Planning Committee members are Dr. Ronald Johnson uh, with the Wireless Infrastructure Association. He's also the lead for the supplier diversity subgroup for the Diversity and Tech Working Group. Clint Odom, National Urban League, and Sean Perriman with the Internet Association. Uh, I'm especially grateful for Sean's continued support and of course the Internet Association's gracious hospitality. They hosted our October showcase and they will host our upcoming spring symposium. So thank you. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, I want to acknowledge the work and our partnership with the FCC Communications Office of Communications Business Opportunities led by Director Sanford Williams. Um, we're delighted that Sanford and Celeste McRae of OCBO join our planning committee every week. Their insight is uh, just tremendous and of course, very helpful as we fulfill our mission. And speaking of mission, supplier diversity as well as empowering DCBs, which we define as uh, any business or an entrepreneur at every stage of development or growth, that would include small businesses, no matter how they're defined, women-owned businesses, ethnic-owned businesses, LGBTQ, veteran-owned and disability-owned businesses. DCB empowerment fulfills the statutory obligations of the FCC. Uh, their success in legacy, as well as new communications and technology industries, fulfills certain statutory obligations that are critically important to making America better. This includes promoting the diversity of media voices, vigorous economic competition, and technological advancement. And our work to facilitate diversity and increase competition in the communication sectors, and to identify and eliminate not just market entry barriers, but also barriers to growth for small businesses and diverse communications businesses. These are all consistent with the FCC statutory obligations. So I'm very pleased that when this committee voted in 2019 to approve our proposal for two related supplier diversity events presented by the FCC, we've been able to meet not just those proposals, but go beyond. Our initial proposal was to do one smaller event first, and then a more substantive event to follow. But little did we know that in less than nine months, the country would be facing a pandemic with unprecedented health and economic crises. During this pandemic, we have lost hundreds of thousands of small businesses that have closed their doors for good. And a recent report says that we're losing 800 small businesses a day. As Rudy mentioned, small businesses are the engine of this nation's economy. In fact, small businesses have represented 99.9% .9 of all U.S. businesses. They provided 50% of private sector jobs and 64% of new jobs in the U.S. So when we lose small businesses, particularly minority-owned businesses, uh, it hurts all of us particularly minority owned businesses, black, brown, and beige communities and owned businesses fare worse. In fact, it's reported that black owned small businesses of those that are still standing, 43% will be out of cash by year's end, notwithstanding the PPP stimulus funds and programs available today. So it was evident that we needed to pivot to make the October showcase even more substantive and relevant for diverse communications businesses. 
Now, although supplier diversity is critically important as a means for DCBs to grow their business by securing lucrative government and corporate contracts, we recognize that the October showcase had to be more than just supplier diversity, since there's so much economic harm and suffering of businesses overall. So our overall objective for both the showcase in October and the spring symposium, we identified that it was a need to help DCBs to do business with major tech or communications companies as vendors, suppliers, and partners to find investors in their businesses or any financial support to help them sustain their business. For DCBs that wish to upgrade or help sustain their businesses using current and or future advancements in technology and to find skilled employees. And for those DCBs that wish to transition to technology-oriented communications industries or to receive additional training, apprenticeship, mentorship, or continuing education, um, we felt a need to make this showcase broader. So in short, the October showcase help to empower DCBs as well as future DCBs. So in summary of our working group action since September 18th, as I noted, we hosted the FCC Tech Supplier Diversity Opportunity Showcase in cooperation with the diversity in tech sector. And we had 166 registrations on a Friday afternoon. We identified and recruited moderators and speakers to participate in two substantive sessions. Uh, and we were delighted that our very own Clint Odom uh, was the moderator for session one, which was show me the money, traditional and alternative sources of capital. Dr. Ron Johnson, again, our very own, was the moderator for session two, how to pivot in a COVID-19 world, opportunities and reinvention strategies for diverse communications businesses. We had two accomplished speakers to provide opening remarks for each of the two substantive sessions. William M. Manger, Chief of Staff and Associate Administrator for the Office of Capital Access, United States Small Business Administration, uh, provided wonderful remarks for our first session, Show Me the Money, and the Honorable Mark Morial, who's President and CEO of the National Urban League, uh, presented inspiring remarks. In fact, uh, very much like going to church, uh, I commend you to the video so you can review Mark's remarks, uh, provided comments prior to session two. We had excellent speakers, high caliber speakers, five to six in each session, representing corporate, government, and nonprofits. And I refer you to the agenda as well, which is on the ACDDE website. We drafted introductory questions uh, to ascertain who was attending our registration, and we had two sets of attendee polling questions asked during the showcase. And this was the first time that we had had polling questions prior to the start of each session uh, to inform the moderators, as well as the speakers on areas of importance and focus on those that were attending. Uh, for example, just prior to our access to capital question, uh, our session, we asked whether or not registrants had an interest or need for financial support, and if so, what type? 78% of those registrants said they have an interest or need, and we asked them what their priorities were, uh, grants, venture capital, private equity, loans, or angel capital. Uh, and it was surprising to know that more than 50% said that grants were a priority. Uh, and that the second category were was ca venture capital and private equity. Uh, so it's not surprising that uh, President Biden's American Rescue Plan includes $15 billion in grants to help the hardest hit businesses and $35 billion for small business financing programs. And I'd like to think that the Biden administration was inspired by our October showcase, uh, but I think that's just wishful thinking. We also conducted a post analysis of our showcase to assess whether the event met our objectives and to help us in planning 
and implementing the spring symposium. Um, the results of that post analysis were that we needed to retain uh, <clears throat> providing a broad range of information, resources, programs, and initiatives. While we anticipated we'd be out of the pandemic by the time of our spring symposium, that obviously is not the case. So we will continue to provide more than just supplier diversity programs. We're gonna provide, again, a wide range of resources, programs, initiatives. We also wanna give uh, more advanced notice for the public notice. So that way there's time for DCBs to schedule and to plan for participating because we will have an opportunity as we've done in previous symposiums hosted by the FCC to have a networking session that DCBs can meet with interested corporate, government and organizational participants one-on-one, -on -one, sort of like speed dating, but from a business purpose. So we want to provide advance notice, uh, hopefully a month in advance. So DCBs can coordinate and plan their schedule. So I'm going to transition to Susan uh, to talk about our uh, actions moving forward until the end of our charter. Susan? Thank you, Janelle. Thank you very much. Well, Janelle has covered so much and some of the uh, things that I'm gonna tell you will uh, be repetitive and I'm gonna save you all the time. Um, I'm Susan L. Allen, the National President and CEO of the U.S. Pan-Asian American Chamber of Commerce here in Washington, D.C. That's where we are headquartered. Uh, we celebrated our 35th anniversary, the J Jubilee last year. It would have been a big bash except for you know who, COVID-19. But nevertheless, uh, as many of us have experienced, actually uh, working at home, remote working has actually caused us to work harder. We have done accomplished more, done more in the last 10 months of uh, 2020 that we have ever done for three years. And we're very proud of it. Part of my work and uh, of enjoyment is working with the FCC and I'm grateful for the opportunity. This is my fourth year as the, at, the, at the ACDDE and it has been a tremendous experience and I learned a lot and I hope that my short uh, term here compared to many of you have contributed so much to the conversation. My organization worked with the US Black Chambers uh, who president had a, a, a PBS a broadcast interview with the vice president Kamala Harris and also the secretary of the treasury just this last weekend. And the U.S. Chambers is one of our partners together with the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce. The four largest diverse Chamber of Commerce have come together six years ago, making up the most diverse group that work together at least six times a year with all our members and the executive to collaborate and exchange best practices and information to bring more diversity and equal opportunity to the business ecosystem of this place we call the United States of America. I'm pleased to be able to see all of you again. The last time I saw you were in September last year. My job here is to share with you what we have done uh, since the last meeting of the ACDDE in September 2020, and also what we plan to do, much of which Jenna has already uh, shared with you uh, as to our plan uh, forthcoming, but I will give you the nitty gritty details. Um, since uh, the, our my, my joining the committee, I have uh, worked with the uh, committee on producing the two, June 2018 Supply Diversity Program which was uh, attended by over 160 people registered and equal number of people had also um, attended. We were very happy about that. Building on that experience uh, with the FCC back in June 2018, uh, we moved on to work on uh, the October 2020 Technology Supply Diversity Opportunity Showcase. It was also well attended, well publicized, and with the help of the planning committee, as well as uh, the FCC Office of uh, Business. Um, I would never be able to learn ACBO and the Media Bureau and the, the designated officers there. Um, we were able to pull a, a, a very successful event together. 
Um, since then, the October 23rd, 2020 event, we have moved forward and planned for our spring technology supply diversity uh, opportunity symposium. And this forthcoming event will be made up of two parts. Part one will be a substantive panel discussion. Part two will be a networking one-on-one, -on -one, as you now call it, speed dating, business matchmaking meeting. Both of them will have the clear objective to talk about the uh, procurement opportunity and trends, the policies, regulatory requirements, and best practices in providing diversity and inclusion opportunities for our diverse businesses. That include women, because they're made up of all diversities, uh, minority, uh, disability, disabled veterans, and LGBTQ community, and including also, of course, the historically underutilized business zones. Um, we're going to talk about training, education, consulting opportunities, uh, mentoring, incubation, apprenticeship programs, and others that will help to bring the diverse suppliers up to a higher level of competency, of knowledge, and access to decision makers, opportunity, and networking, which put them in front of the of the face of folks who actually could help them, give them a extend to them to them a uh, uh, a helping hand so that they can get up on that extra rung on the ladder to prosperity and success. Um, we're going to also talk about some new and recent developments in funding opportunities and funding sources, particularly with uh, COVID-19 still at our back. Now, both panels will have uh, corporations, government agencies, organizations that represent uh, businesses, uh, civil rights and other civic groups attending. And uh, for this, our work in supply diversity is really our, our, our niche. And for this, I want to take a moment to talk to you about tier two. Many in this uh, committee might have heard about it, are, are very familiar with the concept of tier, tier two. You see, agile procurement in the age of digital digital evolution has put a lot of pressure on cost savings, efficiency, and that is detrimental to small and diverse businesses. In the name of cost saving, many government and corporate contracting practices have gravitated towards, and for many years, bundling, consolidation, and for the federal government, uh, category management. That is devastatingly detrimental to the ability of small and diverse businesses to enter into what Rudy called lucrative government and corporate contracting. And if we were to lift up this community that we care so much about, the diverse business community, who have been so devastated, so hurt by COVID-19, taking a good look at this concept of tier two an efficient tier two concept will be very, very helpful. And I want all of us at this committee to dig deep into tier two and make sure that corporation and government contracting have meaningful tier two contracts. Tier two is consist of small and diverse businesses who tend to be flexible, nimble, they're customer oriented, they will always look, walk the extra mile, not so much not, not a, this is not a general statement, but not so much for many of the large corporations, large companies. They also have their own mandate as well. But it is up to us who volunteer for the government, who are in government, who are in civil rights organizations, who are in the in business organizations whose role is to build and grow small and diverse businesses because they are the heart and soul of America. They are the backbone of Country. They create the most jobs, more than Fortune 1000 companies combined, and they have more innovation and patents filed and created than Fortune 1000 companies. 
So I have my spin on tier two. But for today, uh, using minority and other diverse businesses also demonstrated the value, the true value to government, corporate, and large nonprofit contracting. Large nonprofit means what? Means the ARP, means American Red Cross, means a lot of other organizations which buy billions of dollars every year in order to keep the operations running. So let's not forget large nonprofit organization too. We need to put pressure on them. And that in a nutshell is what supply diversity is all about. And that is in a nutshell what we are here all about. And that is why we spend so much time on supply diversity, not just in corporate contracting, but also now we're moving into using technology to help our small and diverse suppliers to get up to that level of competency so the corporation cannot tell us that, but you don't have the bandwidth, you don't have the capacity, you don't have the knowledge. No, sir, no ma'am, we do have it. All we need to do is for you to open that door of opportunity for us. For our uh, panel discussion and also our one-on-one -on -one matchmaking meetings, which I uh, we mentioned earlier, we will have corporations already committed to come and talk. Can I uh, mention AT&T is going to come and talk about their first net uh, opportunity. They're going to bring their um, uh, uh, the team to come and talk uh, to, to meet with the uh, DCBs one on one. Uh, we will have the Northern Virginia Technology Council and uh, their Veteran Employment Initiative. Let me talk about how they uh, help veterans transition into civilian life. Many of them have brought uh, can bring with them their what they have acquired and learned and practiced while in the military, and they can add tremendous value uh, to uh, the supply diversity and government as well as co corporate contracting arena. Uh, we have a lot more, and I'm going to wait a until a little later to share with you the details, but really we want you to stay tuned for uh, uh, April 28th and watch our announcement and register and be with us because this is an, an opportunity you and your constituents should not miss. Can I now turn it over to Janelle and uh, she will uh, continue with this discussion. Janelle. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Um, um, I'd like to uh, just list the full scope of, of the companies, organizations that have already committed to our networking one-on-one -on -one sessions. Susan mentioned AT&T and the Northern Virginia Technology Council. I also want to recognize Comcast, uh, the District of Columbia Department of Small and Local Business Development, Verizon, T-Mobile, Charter Communications, the NAB Leadership Foundation, uh, and the Wireless Infrastructure Association. We still need more uh, volunteers to participate in our networking one-on-one -on -one session. So I appeal, appeal to each one of the uh, representatives here on this committee, uh, we're going to contact you to see if your companies or people that you know within your own network can also participate in our networking sessions. The, this, <clears throat> the networking sessions we first did uh, offline back in, my goodness, June 2018. In fact, it may have been the second time we did the opportunity to have DCBs meet one-on-one -on -one with corporate uh, organizational representatives. And of course, we're transitioning to a virtual platform. This is the first time this has ever been done. We are breaking new ground and still trying to provide networking opportunities for DCBs, but in a virtual world. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of moving parts and complexities in our planning steps. Uh, and many of these steps are concurrent. I'm just going to give you a, just a brief overview of what we're working on right now to make both the substantive part of the Spring Symposium successful, as well as the networking one-on-one sessions. Uh, in terms of our steps and timeline, we are vigorously right now identifying and recruiting moderators and speakers for our substantive sessions, and of course, representatives, corporate, organizational, as well as government uh, people to host a breakout session for our one-on-one -on -one sessions. We've also working with our wonderful, as we call our J team, our designated federal officers, uh, Jamila, Julie, and Jamil, uh, who have already met with the FCC's Office of General Counsel to review and uh, support our 
efforts in terms of how do we do outreach, how do we collect personal information uh, in terms of resumes or whatever, how do we implement the networking sessions. And we're working on the Office of General Counsel's recommendations uh, as we speak, which means we need to draft a terms of service uh, and privacy disclosures. We're also very much involved in the public outreach for publicizing this symposium. If you remember, one of our recommendations from the showcase was to have more lead time. So <clears throat> where the FCC will uh, uh, also invite DCVs to participate in the substantive and networking sessions, we hope with a public notice uh, by mid-March, um, if not the latter part of March, we're counting on the Office of Communications Business Opportunities weekly update. Uh, Celeste does a wonderful job in managing a database of hundreds, and we hope to be thousands of DCBs or people who are interested in what the FCC is doing regarding diversity. That will go out weekly. And we're also counting on our ACDDE committee and working group members to do outreach within your network, uh, industry trade associations, civil rights, and of course, public interest organizations. Uh, that will be from March through April. Uh, we will register, the FCC, I should say, will register and schedule all DCB participants for both the substantive and networking sessions. We have to notify DCBs of what their scheduled interviews are. We will need to notify the participating companies, organizations, and uh, government entities that will host breakout sessions and we'll need to give them specifics on what time and how to access individual platforms. We also provide the opportunity for those that are hosting a breakout session that want to interview and meet one-on-one -on -one with DCBs to host those interviews on their own platform. So we have a system in place with notices and support that you can do that uh, very easily. Uh, and we can help you in terms of contacting DCBs as well as collecting their resume information. We need to draft introductory questions and polling questions. We think the polling questions from the showcase were very probative in what DCBs really need. And of course, we look at um, just implementing the symposium on April the 28th, which was a Wednesday. And after that, we will conduct our analysis, post-analysis, to determine whether our <clears throat> objectives were met our successes and hopefully no failures, but areas that we may want to improve. And we also want the, that post analysis to guide our recommendations moving forward. Susan? Well, that's it. Our goal for the uh, uh, Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group is to deliver a report and recommendations. Uh, we will report on the outcome of the, and impact of the October event last year, and also the forthcoming April symposium this year. Uh, and also to uh, report whether these two events uh, uh, have met or did not meet our objectives that we set out to fulfill. We will provide a recommendation for the FCC and future diversity advocacy um, advisory committee for continued supply diversity efforts that will be consistent with the overall objectives uh, we started today, we stated today. Uh, to that end, uh, we will uh, conduct our post e uh, event analyses of uh, these two events and uh, in consultation with the Diversity in Tech um, Working Group, uh, participants from all those who have been a part of our life for the last uh, uh, two years and uh, <laughs> that, that Janelle had uh, talked about. And then we will um, draft our PowerPoint. Uh, we will uh, make the presentation to you all, and uh, that will be presented in the last uh, at the last ACDDE meeting in June. I am just following my colleague Janelle, who has been uh, such a such a groundbreaker in learning new new styles and uh, uh, new things, and taught me so much. And I want to thank Janelle for all that. Uh, Opportunity, and we have what? This is uh, February, March, April, May, June, July. We have five more months to to prime, <laughs> and then we get our PhD in working on this. And the next group will have a hard act to follow. 
<laughs> Susan, thank you, my friend. You've been an inspiration. So in short, ladies and gentlemen, and, and members of our, uh, our, our committee, our diversity committee, um, we have an obligation and a duty to help bridge not only the digital divide, but the opportunity divide. And the April Spring Symposium is an opportunity to do that. It's our means to give information and resources. Again, supplier diversity is critically important, as Susan noted, but so many other things we're going to bring to the table. DCBs need everything right now. Um, so many are hurting, many are out of business, and many are just hanging by a thread. So it's our effort and our obligation to help as many DCBs in our communications, uh, technology sectors to not just survive, but also to thrive. So we invite each of you to join us uh, either in attending the event or helping us bring more networking participants to the table. So with that, I conclude our report uh, and Rudy, we're handing it over to you. Thank you, everyone. You know Thank you know, so thank you so very much. Uh, based on the various chat, I'm sure there are some comments, so I won't take much time here. Uh, let me open it up for any comments or questions uh, from the uh, from other members of the working group uh, and from the committee uh, broadly. Well, while folks get get I, themselves, I, please go ahead. Oh, this is Fowler again. I'm yeah. sorry. It's just like all the great presentations are happening now. I'm just really excited about the the fair that you're going to do online virtually. I think that is very nuanced, and I know I know it's probably a lot of work to coordinate it. But the idea that y'all are investing time to think through how to actually do it in this moment, where so many businesses are in need, especially from communities that are um, underconnected in so many ways, just it's a really great idea. Uh, you know, Dr. Wilson, uh, when we first embarked on this, uh, we looked at the work that we've done previously because um, we've uh, this is not first rodeo, so to speak. And we said, how do we actually improve it? Well, that was before COVID, which actually raised the barrier uh, for, for us. Um, but I have to tell you, with the amount of time and effort and coordination that Susan uh, and Janelle have put in up to this, we've been able to not only meet the challenge, but also to raise the bar. Uh, and we're providing, you know, not just the actual meet and greet for people to actually make these actual connections. We're really adding rigor to the process that we're developing. So other working groups are going to be able to actually build upon it because we're actually gleaning information, uh, you know, from uh, these uh, you know, diverse communication businesses as we go along. Uh, and we're strengthening relationships with the Small Business Administration, uh, with the Office of uh, you know, Communication Business Opportunity, um, with the Internet As uh, Association, with various communication providers. So we're really bringing in everyone into this tent and, and uh, you know, strengthening certain alliances that we think is going to pay real dividends um, for the businesses that really need it, especially at a time when they desperately need it. So um, it's great that we're doing this work at this particular time. And thank you, Susan and uh, Janelle, for the incredible work that you're doing on this. OK, any other comments? Um, seeing that it is 11.58, uh, I think that we um, uh, conducted ourselves and our presentations um, pretty close to precision. We were scheduled to end at 11.55. We're only three minutes uh, um, you know, beyond our schedule. So in my book, uh, that's good for work. So um, you know, thank you very much. Let me turn it back to uh, our uh, distinguished chair, um, Anna Gomez. Thank you. Very much, Rudy. Thank you, Harine, Laura, uh, Shelley, Roy, Estranel, and Susan. Uh, as you can see, the working group has been very hard at work in developing their work plans and does not lack for passion in the work that they are doing. Uh, I agree with all the members who have been putting in the chat. This has been very good report, and the work that you're doing is so important. Um, as Rudy said, the digital inclusion subgroup has focused on adoption. I'm so glad that the subgroup has been working on libraries and tribal libraries in particular. Libraries are such important community resources, yet they face challenges as highlighted by the working group's work. And we're so lucky that Ian has joined us as he gives us terrific expertise. 
I look forward to working with the working group on their final report and their recommendations to the commission. In addition, I'm glad the working group is highlighting the programs that companies are providing to ensure broadband adoption. One thing we have learned is that those in the community who most can benefit from these programs may not know about them. Hopefully, our work highlighting the programs will get more people connected. And finally, thank you for your work on putting together the Supplier Diversity Showcase and the upcoming Supplier Diversity Symposium. As you noted, these efforts are particularly important because small businesses and DZBs in particular have suffered greatly in the pandemic. As Estenel said, we still need more companies that have supplier diversity programs to participate in the symposium networking sessions. So I encourage all of our ACDDE members to talk to their companies, talk to their members um, about participating. I am very thankful to those who have already done so. So um, since we already had our comment sections, I think what we will do now is we will break for lunch. We will have 30 minutes for lunch. Uh, and when we return, um, I, uh, I'll uh, take another roll call at the beginning of our afternoon session. Um, and it, actually, I, I, Heather, I, should, I apologize, my fantastic vice chair. Is there anything that you would like to add? Hi, Anna. I was busy typing away in the, <laughs> in the comment section. Um, I just want to, again, thank the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group and all the um, sub, sub chairs uh, for the presentation. Um, I'm often in awe of <laughs> how much time and effort they're all putting it, into it with more than one meeting a week sometimes. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate the presentations. Uh, I just want to make sure that you all, again, heed the call to action from Susan and S. Janelle to, to help make the upcoming symposium a success, particularly the networking session, because that's really the meat of helping to move the, need, move the needle for um, small businesses, small, diverse, and, and minority-led businesses. So again, thank you all. I, I really enjoyed um, the discussion. I look forward to continuing after lunch. Thank you, Heather. OK, let's break for lunch. Please remember to turn off your video and your microphones, and we will reconvene. This group will reconvene at, 10, uh, at, at 1220 um, and the public meeting will begin at 1230. Thanks all. Welcome back to uh, the meeting of the FCC Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment. I will now take roll call again. Uh, so please remember to unmute yourself after I call your name and let us know that you are present. Raul Alarcón. Susan Allen. Here. Laura Barakal. Here. Caroline Beasley. Here. Cindy Benavides. Shelly Blakeney. Sorry, this is Cindy. I'm here. Hi, Cindy. Hi, everyone. Hi, Shelly Blakeney is present as well. Hi. Hi. Maria Brennan. Rudy Brioche. Here. Korean contractor, did you make it back? He said he may be a little late. Uh, Skip Dillard. I am here. Michelle Duke. Deborah Elam. I'm here, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Marita Coley. Here. <laughs> Dr. Harrison, Dr. Dominique. Rashidi Hendricks. Here, present. Thank you. David Honig. Here. 
Dr. Ron Johnson. I thought I saw him. Chairman Kizart. Roy Litland. Here. Duan McCoy. Here. Sean Perriman. Henry Rivera. Here. Steve Roberts. Here. Brian Scarpelli. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Dr. Shukla. That's Janelle Trigg. Good afternoon. I'm here. Dr. Nicole Turner Lee. Good afternoon. I'm here. Good afternoon. Jim Winston. And Chris Wood. Good afternoon. I'm here. Oh, hi. Uh, for our uh, working group uh, members, Robert Brooks. Here. Milton Clipper. Rosa Mendoza. Here. Cecilia Gordon. Garrett Kumjazi. Present. Garrett, how am I, am I saying your name correctly? Uh, Kumyadi, it's a tough one. Kumyadi, thank you. I'll make that phonetic. Amin Ahuja. Present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dr. Allison Scott. Present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dean Skorodin. Felicia West. Good afternoon. Present. And Dr. Fallon Wilson. Present. And I see Dr. Ron Johnson's he, present. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. I was I was muted out and uh, pictured out, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so we've been getting some questions from the public. We will address those questions during the Q, uh, the Q and A, the public Q and A portion of this meeting uh, later on this afternoon after the working group presentations. So um, let's move on now to Carolyn's group, um, which is going to uh, uh, give us their presentation um, on the act, uh, the activities of the Access to Capital Working Group, and I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here today with the other members of the group. A special thank you to FCC Chairwoman Rosen Warsaw, as well as to Commissioner Starks, Carr, and Simington, and Michelle Carey for their uh, participation in today's events. And in addition, thank you, Anna and Heather, for your ongoing support. And then last but not least, uh, a big thank you to the three J's. Uh, in addition, I'd like to welcome our newest member of the working group, and that is Robert Brooks, who is with WHUR in Washington. Robert, welcome to our uh, working group. Uh, as a reminder, we have three subgroups uh, within the working group, and each has been hard at work since our last meeting in September. As you may know, we've hosted a virtual symposium on November 6, and I must say it was action-packed and very, very informative. The subgroups are as follows. Our lending finance subgroup is chaired by Dewan McCoy. Our political subgroup is chaired by Nahuja Ama, and our broadcast subgroup is chaired by Skip Dillard. Each of these subgroups have committed a great deal of time and energy to their respective goals, missions within the subgroups. 
and they will outline the highlights of the symposium as well as their planned actions between now and the end of the charter. So uh, with that, we will start this afternoon's comments from Dewan McCoy, who is president and CEO of Circle City Broadcasting and our lending finance subgroup chair. Dewan, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Uh, glad to be here, everybody, and uh, hope you're having a great afternoon so far. Uh, Caroline, thank you so much for your, your leadership uh, on our working group. Um, we also have two other members of our working group, uh, Garrett Kamyathi and Steve Roberts. Why don't I take uh, two minutes and have uh, start with Steve and have them introduce themselves to you uh, so you have a little bit of background, then we'll go to Garrett, then we'll jump right into our short presentation. Okay, Steve? Good. Uh, thank you very much, Duane. Uh, it's an honor to serve with you on this uh, committee. And those of you who don't know, uh, Duane, even though he looks young, he's really a taskmaster in, in whipping some of us together on this. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Um, for, for many of you who are on this call, uh, you know the history of the Roberts Broadcasting Entities. Uh, we have been FCC licensees for over 30 years, owning over 15 TV stations, radio stations, and we were in the wireless communications bus uh, business. We were affiliated at Spring, so our licenses came from the FCC. So uh, we know the FCC and the team there very well. And I have to tell you, as someone who was a part of the previous committee, uh, I'm just really encouraged by the support that the commission and the staff has given those of us who are in the private sector, who every day are employing people and creating opportunities for families across this country. And I will also have to say, since I've known so many commissioners uh, and chairs, uh, I was really very encouraged by the the words that I heard today. Um, all of the commissioners said they believe in our mission. They believe in the importance of creating opportunities for minority and women-owned uh, businesses, uh, not only in ownership, but also in employment opportunities. And for someone like Duane and I, who every day are looking for talented people to come into uh, our industries, uh, it means a lot to me and uh, I hope that they will uh, continue this vision on beyond uh, the, uh, the ending date of this particular uh, timeline. Um, I would also like to say that um, the toughest thing, and Duan and the other members of this subcommittee uh, have, have discussed time after time, is the difficulty of women and minorities to get into the field of broadcasting media and even the wireless communications. And so our task was to focus on how do we get, uh, how do we partner people up? How do we uh, give them opportunities to go into this very exciting field? Uh, Duan is, is a very thorough chairman, so he'll give you more detail. But I, I wanted uh, the rest of the uh, board to know that what you've got with Duane and I, uh, Duane, who's probably one of our most exciting uh, young entrepreneurs in this field and, and, and the Roberts companies who have been in it for a long time, how we are pulling our resources and experience to make a difference in this country. And we have that opportunity. Thank you, Duane. Thank you, Steve. Garrett, you want to jump in and give a brief uh, outline of who you are and what you do? Of course, Dewan, thank you. And, and again, thank you, uh, Caroline, for one, for giving me an opportunity to be on this committee and, De and Dewan uh, to work with you. Um, in terms of my background, I've been a media lender for the better part of 25 years, covering the entire spectrum of companies from small radio and TV operators all the way up to large um, corporate clients such as Comcast, Walt Disney, and people of that scope. Um, by way of background, I've had um, professional and lending relationships and personal relationships with both Caroline and Duan for purposes of full disclosure. So um, US Bank is the nation's fifth largest bank. 
longtime media lender, and um, it's been an honor to be on this committee. Dewan? Thank you, Garrett. Uh, so what we want to do for, for the uh, viewers today and listeners today is just give a quick two-prong recap of what we did since our September 18th meeting. That'll be the first section, and Garrett will talk about that. Then we're going to get into the plan of work stream actions from February 11th all the way up until uh, the end of this session, which will be right around July 5th. So, Garrett, you want to just give a quick recap of what we did uh, from September 18th till now? Of course. Yes. And and um, just by way of maybe give a, a little bit more detail, um, our team met, I, it felt like it was every Friday to um, get our presentation together. Um, the purpose of our presentation, again, everyone acknowledges the challenges that minorities and females face in you know, ownership and also at the same time providing you know, diversity of, of voice. And in order to be an owner, one of the most critical things is to be able to obtain financing and capital to acquire stations. And what we ended up doing as part of our presentation in September, we used a real live scenario, which actually involved um, my bank financing Dewan McCoy's um, prior company. And we went through in detail what we typically require from prospective owners um, with respect to documentation requirements, financial requirements, in order to get a deal done. And it was a, you know, a four-person panel, including myself, one of my colleagues, Daniel Damon, who's in the Loan Capital Markets Group for U.S. Bank, and he gave, the two of us gave our perspective on, you know, what are the requirements, what are the things that prospective owners should be looking for. And then we used Dewan and his CFO, Ty Shea, and, and basically went through the series of events that from, you know, my initial introduction to Dewan to every step through the process uh, in, in an abbreviated fashion and to the successful conclusion of that financing and then Dewan's subsequent sale of that company. Um, as part of that dialogue, there, there was um, Q&A from prospective listeners and uh, I received obviously some follow-up emails from participants that listened in to follow up our presentation. Dewan, would you care to add to add to that? Yeah, yeah, that that pretty much uh, is a pretty good uh, synopsis of it, Garrett. What I'd like to add as well, the the presentation was named "Obtaining Financing in Today's Changing Environment." And what we tried to accomplish without going through the details of the, the presentation again, but what we tried to accomplish is give different scenarios, whether it be small business lending, where you're working with the SBA, where you're working with a middle market uh, a fund manager, uh, or working with a senior bank. But we tried to lay out in the presentation how to obtain financing through any economic turn uh, that we have, good time and bad times. So what we try to do next to extend that presentation, we presented that presentation on November 6th and we probably had a few thousand people watching. But for our goal as a committee, we wanna make this document and this presentation public, okay? We wanna make it easily accessible to the women and, and, and and people of color and minorities that are really, really sincere and interested in obtaining financing for broadcast properties or media pop properties. So what we plan to do is, one, we're going to recruit, recruit advocacy groups and stakeholders within the industry that want to allow this document to be on their site. Okay? And will recruit those folks in those advocacy groups and help, help them put together a section on their website so that 
Again, people interested in obtaining financing can go at their leisure to those websites to read a quote unquote, how to raise financing and what to do from a financing standpoint. I've been fortunate and I've been blessed to be one of the few current African-Americans to be able to obtain financing for media properties. And again, I've been fortunate to be able to do it at very different levels from a $3 million acquisition all the way up to $165 million uh, acquisition. So part of my give back is to, to give the knowledge that I've learned along, along the way so that we can, uh, we can help others uh, try to get into the media. So we feel that by putting this path to uh, uh, obtaining financing in a today's changing environment on websites, we're going to be able to attract more folks and educate more people uh, in, into the space. Then on our final meeting, uh, which is going to be around June 24th, we plan to present and click through and show you the amount of stakeholders and, and who is willing to participate uh, in this public forum, if you will, uh, on obtaining financing in today's environment. Additionally, I failed to, 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 to say, uh, we're also going to recruit stakeholders, financial stakeholders, like the Gary Kamyathis of the world and the U.S. banks of the world, uh, so that they can also lend a helping hand and educate uh, women and people of color on how to obtain financing. So, Steve, did I miss anything? Did, is there anything else that you'd like to chime in on? No, no, I think, uh, Dewan, you hit it uh, well. Um, the, the important thing that I want our, uh, our listeners to be aware of is that, uh, you know, the problem that we're facing today is not one that happened overnight. Um, you know, we've been in the business, like I said, for over, th over three decades. And when we initially bought our first few TV stations, um, there were, you know, over 25 uh, African-American women on broadcast groups in the United States. Well, what I've seen over the last 30 years is that, you know, that's down to three or four, basically. So uh, this problem has not uh, come about overnight, and it's not going to be fixed overnight. But we think with, and why I may want to talk about it, with some of the legislative initiatives that uh, we're proposing in life, you know, my background is politics, um, as well as looking at uh, legislation that could be changed, as well as, I think, a an environment today where lenders uh, understand that there's got to be a greater social compact with our communities by creating and supporting businesses that create and support employment opportunities for those who normally wouldn't have an opportunity. So um, uh, it's an exciting time because we clearly have an administration in Congress that will listen to us, uh, but we have to step through the door as a group and make these changes occur uh, because the window can close very, very close. Uh, the window can close very quickly if we don't assert ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, I'll kick it back to you, Caroline. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Juwan, Garrett, and Steve. Um, does anyone have any questions from the group uh, for this particular subgroup? Okay, hearing none, um, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Nahuja Ama. Uh, she's legal counsel of A Wonder Media Company, and she is our political subgroup chair. Nahuja? Yes, thank you, Carolyn. Good afternoon. Uh, our subgroup would like to thank you for this opportunity to share our work. Like the other groups, we do want to thank our working group chair, Caroline Beasley, the advisory committee chair, Anna Gomez, and co-chair, Heather Gate, and all the FCC commissioners who participated today. Finally, we also want to thank the FCC deputy officers, Jamila Best Johnson, Julie Saulnier, and Jamil Kadri for all of their work with our group. 
consistent with the subgroups that preceded us, we will be, we will be reporting on our actions since September 18th, 2020, and also give you an update on our work stream plan and deliverables through to the end of our term on June 24th, 2021. Our subgroup chose to focus on legislative proposals for policies that support diversity of management and media ownership. There were any number of such legislative offerings in Congress, but we zeroed in on reviewing two proposals. Both of these proposals were presented in our signature action on which we worked from September 18th until November 6, 2020. For November 6, the political subgroup organized a panel for the Access to Capital Working Group's virtual symposium entitled Path to Media Ownership and Sustainability. The first half of the panel titled Tax Certificate Policies to Increase Ownership Diversity, Past, Present, and Future featured a summary of the history of the tax certificate policy, which essentially quadrupled the diverse media ownership between its introduction in 1978 and its repeal in 1995. This was presented by David Honig, a member of the political subgroup. The first half of the panel also included my presentation on the potential for a new tax certificate policy to increase media ownership diversity, specifically the Butterfield Tax Certificate Bill or the Butterfield Bill. In addition, a congressional staff member provided an update on other pending legislation intended to increase diverse media ownership. Now, the second half of the panel on November 6 featured a discussion moderated by Henry Rivera of the Emma Bowen Foundation, Wiley Rain LLP, and Marita Coley Flippin, president of the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council. It included broadcasters who had benefited from the past certificate program or who were desiring to take advantage of a reinstated tax certificate program. The featured broadcasters on the panel were Russell M. Perry, CEO of Perry Broadcasting, Tomas Martinez, co-owner of Solmart Media, Jeffrey Simulian, chairman and CEO of Emmis Communication, and Sarah Lomax Rees, president and CEO of WURD Radio. The political subgroup has two planned work stream actions and deliverables from today, February 11th, to the end of the current advisory committee charter. In the first work stream action, the political subgroup would develop recommendations to the working group on enhancements to the Butterfield Bill and also maybe other federal tax incentive legislation provisions that the advisory committee may wish to recommend that the FCC support to increase diverse media ownership and representation. The political subgroup will research and discuss with stakeholders the following related provisions that could enhance the Butterfield Bill's ability to increase diverse media ownership. Uh, during our November 6th symposium, one of the questions put to the panelists regarded the ownership and control percentage requirement under the Butterfield Bill. I have asked David Honig to share information with us on two issues related to the Butterfield Bill. David Honig is President Emeritus and Special Advisor to the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council and a member of the political subgroup. Specifically, he will give a short discussion on reassessing ownership and control percentage requirements for the diverse party triggering the tax certificate and whether the FCC should participate in determining the percentage of equity that a socially disadvantaged business must hold to qualify for a tax benefit. And then second, he will assess whether the donor giving a broadcast station to a training institute should receive a tax credit as an incentive. David, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Yes, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're, you're loud and clear. Oh, that's great. So as we all agree and understand, um, the principal barrier to minority and women ownership in media and telecom has been access to capital for 
four or five decades. Um, a very quick summary of and refresher on kind of the tax certificate policy and how it was came about and what it would be, what would happen to it. Um, uh, I can provide that in about a minute to refresh everyone's memory. It actually was created in 1970 to take some of the um, um, responsibility of easing the, the um, financial um, impact of an involuntary um, assignment of license or transfer of control to break up a local combination when it wasn't grandfathered, like a newspaper and a TV station or a TV station and an FM station. Subsequently, it was amended to include voluntary um, uh, breakups of local media combinations um, and, um, and proved to be pretty successful. The, the, the basic premise of the policy was that the seller of one of these entities that would be by its sale have diversity be enhanced, the diversity with a small d, um, would receive a deferral of payment of capital gains taxes on the sale, assuming that there were capital gains, upon reinvestment in comparable property. So this, of course, it's always better to pay taxes with tomorrow's dollars than today's dollars. So this really took advantage of the time value of money in creating an incentive that didn't raid the Treasury. Um, in 1977, Chairman Dick Wiley created the first of what became five, This, our, our group being the fifth one, ACDDE, uh, diversity-related advisory committees. And Chairman Ferris, Chairman Wiley, and then subsequent to him, Chairman Ferris in 1977 and 78, um, charged that group with coming up with a truly dramatic way to enhance minority ownership. The recommendation ultimately became um, a commission policy in the Statement of Policy on Minority Ownership of Broadcast Stations. For those who want to look it up, 68 FCC 2nd 979 1978, basically taking the policy as it existed previously and extending it to situations where a cable system or a broadcast station uh, were sold to a minority controlled company. The original definition of what would qualify as a um, minority controlled company was left somewhat muddled. Um, it was assumed, I think, at the time that that may, would mean 51% of the votes and 51% of the equity, but subsequently the development of tools like LLPs and LLCs allowed someone who did not have, who was not cash rich, um, but still had access to some capital some skin in the game, to come in with 20% of the um, equity, um, but 51% of the votes. That was the recommendation of an advisory committee in 1982, chaired by former, uh, at that time, current FCC Commissioner Henry Rivera. And it has basically been the law and the commission's policy ever since. Before the policy was repealed in 1995, it had quintupled the number of minority-owned broadcast stations. Probably the less said about the repeal, the better. Let's pick it up in 2000 when John McCain introduced the first of several bills to get the policy restored. Other bills were been, had been introduced in the next few years after that by Congressman um, Charlie Rangel, Congressman Bobby Rush, Senator um, um, Menendez, and now this one, starting in 2017 and reintroduced the last couple of years from Congressman H.G. Butterfield of North Carolina. Um, of course, because it is a tax bill, it must go through review both of the um, Commerce Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. There has never been a hearing on any of these bills before Ways and Means. And um, what sometimes happens is it's necessary to bundle together several tax-related provisions in an omnibus tax bill. Standalone tax provisions very seldom get enacted. But if there are five or six or seven tax provisions, each with its own sponsor and its own constituency of support, then that gains critical mass and that passes. So one question that we therefore turn to is, well, what else could be done besides through the classic tax certificate route to advance diversity in our industries? And is there, as Nahuja mentioned, Anything in the um, Butterfield last draft, the 2020 draft, that could be improved as necessary. We came up with a list of some five different things and have narrowed it through our consultations with one another and with experts to three. Um, first, we, 
we originally thought perhaps uh, a tax incentive-based incubator program might be a way to get that off the ground after more than 30 years. Um, but it appears that that would be fought vigorously by those who feel that the incentive to incubate should be a reduction in in the, an additional rather an additional station that you could acquire in, under the local ownership rules. So rather than provoke a fight, this isn't the right place. We decided to recommend um, that an incubator provision be included. We did feel that there was one sentence in the Butterfield bill which we would hope that his office would be would consider changing, and that is the sentence that provides that the definition of a qualified buyer would be 51% ownership, 51% equity, and that instead the commission as the expert agency be authorized to decide what the standard should be. Maybe it's and probably should be around 20% of the um, equity and 51% of the votes. Um, as the Rivera Commission in 1982 provided, but it could be something else. So simply saying 51% or such other number as the commission through a rulemaking would decide, and that phrase would be the only thing that we think probably should be changed. Um, we also considered whether this was the right time and place to propose the extension of this legislation to telecom, but scoring, especially given the state of the economy, is going to be an issue, the, the, a threshold issue at Ways and Means. And if telecom were included now in one deal, given the multiple size of uh, the, the, the multiplier, the size of these deals, could blow up the whole program. So this probably isn't the time and place either. Two additional provisions that could go in simultaneously or in separate leg legislation at the will and desire of the, both of the House committees. Uh, one would be to give a small broadcaster a tax credit upon the donation of a station to a training institution and uh, in that way have them be able to honorably exit a family business and also do some good for the next generation of broadcasters. Uh, that's been proposed about 10 years ago. No opposition to it has surfaced. The other is a proposal that Condista has uh, floated as a way to ameliorate some of the um, uh, co controversy that always arises in this question of, of transmission consent, retransmission consent, carriage of, of, of uh, channels, and so forth. A fair point that's been made by many over the years is that um, there aren't very many opportunities for qualified independent programmers to get on uh, on an MBPD. So they came up with the idea of having an MB, MBPD tax credit for the carriage of qualified independent programmers, and they've made a presentation, um, and, it's, and it, it does seem that it has legs and is worthy of inclusion and, and consideration by the two uh, committees. So between now and the end of the term, July 5th, we'll, we hope to kind of move these things along through um, the commission's Office of Legislative Affairs, which of course should take the lead and has been engaged on this issue for five years since the commission endorsed it in the 257 channel, the section 257 report that they issued that year. So that concludes my report and I'd love to take any questions anyone might have. We'll see if people have questions at the end. Thank you, David. Um, Thank you. Let me move on with our, our plan steps and deadline dates for completion of our work stream action. Um, you know, we're planning during February. This is really just related to the Butterfield Bill. During February, we're going to reach out to associates and other public and private stakeholders <clears throat> to discuss and assess the possible impacts of diverse media ownership of the of the above possible additions or related provisions to the Butterfield Bill. And in March, uh, we'll report on those discussions at our meeting um, so that our subgroup members will be better informed about the status of an interest in these possible enhancements. Uh, in mid-April, the subgroup will prepare a draft of the possible tax incentive enhancements to the Butterfield Bill 
um, that we want to recommend to the working group. And during that first subgroup meeting, members will discuss and develop a consensus on the draft and prepare final recommendations to make to the working group. By mid-May, uh, the subgroup will forward its final recommendations to the working group and the advisory committee. And then on June 24th, any um, final recommendations related to enhancements to the Butterfield Bill that have been approved by the working group uh, at the final meeting, um, we will we'll review them. So our second work stream action is um, other possible tax incentive legislative provisions that could contribute to increasing diverse media ownership and representation apart from the Butterfield bill. And um, David spoke, spoke about it when he was talking about the Condista uh, proposal, which is you know more in the line of a programming initiative. So I'm not going to have him come on and explain it again, but that's kind of what we're going to look at in our work stream uh, action. And then the, 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 the deadline dates for that basically coincide with um, what we're going to be doing uh, with the Butterfield Bill. That is that, you know, we'll re do reach out to associates and other public and private stakeholders to discuss this additional programming that could be included, but it would have to probably, would probably be a separate a separate bill, and what, um, you know, so we'll follow up on that, and then um, we'll report on any discussions that we have in in April, and we'll do the draft summary, like I mentioned before, and um, then uh, by the end of April, we'll come up with a consensus to decide whether this is an additional tax incentive legislation provision that we want to recommend for further study or possible support by the working group or the advisory committee, and then finalize you know, the, summary, the summary and recommendations and then forward it on to the working group, of course. Huja, I think we lost your sound. I think you're muted. Lost it? Now Never. you're back. Back. Okay. I the last you said was, and then forward our recommendations, and then you went. You went mute. Went mute. Okay. All right. So I was just. I just was moving on to the deliverables, which um, our subgroups deliverables for our final uh, advisory council meeting will be based on our committee work, the November sixth uh, symposium tax certificate, and also. Um, polling of various stakeholders, which, you know, we've pretty much concluded that the Butterfield Bill is valuable legislation that, if passed, it will increase diversity of broadcast ownership. So the political subgroup will focus on the need for the Butterfield Bill to remain front of mind among the public, Congress, and other stakeholders. And we'll plan on delivering a recommendation that the working group, if they approve it, um, and the of, Advisory Committee urged the FCC through its Office of Legislative Affairs to support passage of the Butterfield Bill by the current Congress. Um, the steps for, for uh, this deliverable in terms of the Butterfield Bill and the steps for the, the second deliverable, which is related to the other tax incentives that are not enhancements to the Butterfield Bill, uh, the timeline goes from April to June, and in that regard, we plan to, um, it, by mid-April, decide upon a draft and a summary of a possible tax incentive enhancements to the Butterfield Bill and also uh, anything that is not an enhancement to the Butterfield Bill, uh, if it's approved. By the end of May, prepare, finalize, and obtain approval by the working group for any desired presentation for our June final meeting. And then, of course, in June, make the final presentation and seek uh, the advisory council approval to recommend that the FCC support 
the Butterfield bill and if there is if there are any other uh, provision legislative provisions that are approved and supported by the working group um, and the advisory account that, that the FCC support those as well. And that uh, pretty much concludes um, our presentation. I know our like the other subgroups, we have a lot of work cut out for us, but we believe this is important and to our mission and will increase diverse media ownership. So thank you, and I'll turn this back over to Caroline. Okay, thank you, Nahuja. Um, we'd like to open it up for questions for this particular subgroup. Does anyone have questions? Okay, well, hearing or seeing what, uh, none, we will move on to the last subgroup that we have, and that is our broadcast subgroup. Uh, and this subgroup is chaired by Skip Dillard, who is VP of National and Community Partnerships with WBLS and WLIB in New York. Skip, it's my pleasure to uh, hand this over to you. All right, thank you uh, so much, Caroline. I would like to first take the time to recognize our broadcast subgroup members, they're just an incredible group of people I've learned so much from. Our newest member, Robert Brooks, who is a sales executive with WHUR-FM, Howard University in Washington, D.C., and I won't hold that against him since I attended Hampton, so, you know, it's our arch nemesis there, but um, we're all friends in this environment. Um, also, I uh, want to uh, give special thanks to Dr. Namisha Shukla. She is a pediatrician and a broadcast donor as well. Attorney uh, James Winston, who is president of the National Association of Black-Owned Broadcasters. Sherman Kizart, managing director of Kizart Media Partners. And last but not least, Raul Alacron, president, CEO, and chairman of Spanish Broadcasting Systems. Our subgroup focuses on hopeful uh, entry-level broadcasters, new broadcasters, and existing broadcast owners in radio and TV uh, looking not just to survive, but thrive. And we worked on many uh, activities and narrowed it down uh, to what was most important uh, to our businesses. To start off, uh, our group worked on planning the Access to Capital uh, on November 6th symposium, which was virtual preparing sessions with guest uh, representatives covering the following subjects of current interest to broadcast owners and operators. Um, we began our first panel with Nielsen ratings and technology. This was led by Nielsen officials and Dr. Shukla and attorney James Winston uh, headed that panel for us. Our Nielsen officials covered the following uh, questions uh, and issues. Uh, first, what new tools from Nielsen Ratings can assist broadcasters in maximizing revenue, understanding more about station performance, and increasing productivity? Especially for new broadcasters, this is crucial, as many wind up with stations not fully understanding uh, not only how the ratings methodology works, but how the data uh, that comes from uh, the methodology and the results uh, can help them greatly in their business. Also, uh, second was how Nielsen's technology has been updated to better incorporate measurement of streaming, wireless headphone use, and emerging broadcast technologies. So one of these would be the smart speaker. Uh, we also could talk about uh, the emergence of cars that are totally connected with Wi-Fi and hotspots. Um, how does Nielsen continue to upgrade uh, their measurement abilities against the technology that is forever quickly changing. Also, what training programs are available for broadcast content and sales by Nielsen representatives? Uh, there are many uh, training resources, uh, including uh, virtual and, uh, once we get through the pandemic, on-site visits. Uh, education is most important, not for senior, not only for senior uh, level, but for staffers in general to consistently uh, stay ahead of the game. We then had an advertising agency roundtable moderated by Sherman Kizart and Raul Alacron. 
The executive's discussion on this roundtable for advertising included how broadcasters pitch decision makers at top advertising firms. We talked about recent government agency actions to foster more spending with small and minority owned broadcasters. Also resources that were available to small minority operators to help grow advertising dollars spent at radio and TV stations. I can personally attest to the fact that government spending helped us greatly during the pandemic with the census uh, advertising we were able to uh, receive uh, through uh, advertising agencies uh, that were uh, uh, spending uh, government dollars to promote participation in the U.S. Census. Uh, there were uh, many advertising buys that uh, were uh, so appreciated by small and minority broadcasters. Also, we wanted to explore contacts with government agencies that advertise to share information with broadcasters on how to increase their radio and TV ad spend. As we move forward, uh, our actions for uh, the near future uh, to the end of our charter, we know that small and minority broadcasters often need more Nielsen training throughout their organizations to maximize advertising revenue and content performance through use of Nielsen research. Ratings and data are often overlooked by small and potential broadcast owners, limiting their opportunities for success. The subgroup will request a follow-up session with Nielsen, which is in the works. The sessions will discuss a possible Nielsen toolkit that would be made available on both Nielsen and, if approved, FCC ACDDE websites. Plan steps and deadline dates for completion of Workstream Action 1. Uh, in January, we are working, uh, January, we worked to set up a following Nielsen session. We have been in contact. And uh, going on into March, uh, discussing with the broadcast subgroup the possibility for a Nielsen ACDDE best practices handbook for broadcasters. Our work stream action uh, two is the broadcast subgroup has identified a need to encourage diversity in advertising content through further dialogue with major advertising agencies to increase multicultural spending in TV and radio. Nonprofit organizations, including the National Black Chamber of Commerce, multicultural media, Telcom and Internet Council and the National Association of Black-Owned Broadcasters could be enlisted to provide guidance and create partnerships. The goal will be to create relationships with multicultural advertising agencies to foster a better pipeline between small, women, minority broadcasters in the advertising industry. Our planned uh, steps here is that uh, we have had a subgroup meeting and determined our first steps. Uh, we are working to follow up with participating organizations. Um, we are working to execute in March through mid-April a plan of action, including compelling tools and resources for broadcasters seeking increased advertising revenue. And in mid to late April, review a draft uh, of resource materials uh, by the FCC and ACDDE leaders. Finally, for our working group deliverables, uh, deliverables for Nielsen, um, we do want to develop a Nielsen toolkit to help small and diverse broadcasters maximize advertising revenue and content performance through the use of Nielsen research. Our planned steps include an agreement from Nielsen to draft a template, um, also a ACDDE Nielsen meetings to outline information that would be provided in this toolkit. Our goal is to have that done by the end of March. Our next step would be to draft the FCC ACDDE leadership review and approval of toolkit uh, during uh, April and May, and the adoption of the toolkit by the ACDDE by June 24th, and to post on our Nielsen and FCC uh, websites, uh, if approved by the FCC, by the end of our charter. Our working group deliverable too will involve compiling tools and resource materials for broadcasters seeking increased advertising revenue, share materials with broadcasters, and post on the ACDDE page and FCC websites. Our planned steps to accomplish our advertising deliverable too 
Uh, that will be to uh, contact advertising agency representatives who participated in the November 6th symposium by the end of this month, identify and seek participation of nonprofit broadcast advertising support agencies and government agencies by the end of March, draft the best practices to be delivered to the FCC by April 15th and ACDDE leadership by April the 22nd, and the fourth step, approval and adoption of resource materials by the ACDDE and posting on the ACDDE webpage of the FCC website uh, by the end of our charter. Um, this is a pretty ambitious and, and, and busy time for us, and we definitely look forward to uh, completing these tasks, which you know we are in agreement uh, could help make a difference for uh, small and minority broadcasters as well as those uh, uh, in the broadcast business that are small and large. We feel like they're, uh, you know, definitely uh, steps that can uh, improve uh, life for our broadcasters as we start to move out of the pandemic and, and look forward to better times. Um, thank you. And if there are any questions, uh, ready for them. I do have one. Um, first and foremost, I find the broadcast subgroup to be really exciting, primarily because you sit at the intersections of now, not only traditional ways in which we think about broadcasting, but looking specifically at platforms and how they do streaming. So when you started talking about streaming and like some of the tools that have been created by black and brown and minority entrepreneurs to get into this space, like listener from like Rodney Williams to stream content, right? just effortlessly through cars and through, it is an exciting time to think about how, how, how the intersections of platforms, right? Apple, Apple TV, right? Media content creators from YouTube and thinking about how we really can broaden the scope of broadcasting to really look at these new engaging um, entrepreneurs um, from minority communities to get into this space. And so really broadening the definition of broadcasting is exciting for me. The other thing that's really exciting is thinking about Nielsen and making sure that they're collecting data that really reflects, once again, this broad emerging categories where we find so many um, people of color minorities being engaging in space, right? Creating their own streaming content and then trying to figure out what is the best procurement processes to get to be on HBO Max versus being on Apple TV versus Roku, which creates their own TVs. And then they also be able to rank based on what you're able to pay to get on to be able to be seen as a prime um, streaming network. So, oh, this is Fallon. I'm sorry. You know, I'm just excited that it, it is it, it creates a great opportunity to really broaden all the things that we're talking about on this full committee. It deals with internet. It deals with entrepreneurship. It deals with streaming. It deals with platforms. And yeah, really exciting content that you just gave. I would just have you say streaming because I was like, I know streaming is important to this because there are so many young um, people of color creating content and trying to figure out their way and trying to figure out how to get access there. Well, you know, I, I totally agree. And thank you so much for your comment. Um, we all know as broadcasters, we're far bigger today than our towers. And, and so while the terrestrial, uh, you know, has always a focus and continues to be, uh, we do know that, you know, the future uh, is through being able to uh, make use of all the technology tools, as well as the data, the increased uh, data that is provided to us uh, from uh, Nielsen and so many of its partners. And uh, the better we can use that data, uh, the better we can broaden our definition of what radio and television is and uh, live well in the mobile universe that we're in, uh, the better off uh, and, and healthier uh, our industry will be. Great. Are there any more questions uh, for Skip? So thank you, Skip, and um, thanks to everyone within our working group and the subgroups. And uh, I hope that you are as pleased uh, with their accomplishments to date and their uh, very aggressive goals through the end of June as I am. So this concludes the Access to Working Capital Group report. And Anna, I'm now going to hand it back over to you. Thank you very much, Caroline, Carolyn, uh, Duan, Robert, Garrett, Nahuja, David, and Skip. Uh, I am very impressed. Uh, the working group has put in a lot of work. As we've said, all the working groups have, are doing meeting after meeting and continuing to work on, on uh, advancing their individual group's projects. 
Uh, this working group, of course, has really thought about ways to improve access to capital for women and minorities and has delved into the challenges for getting financing. Your goal of sharing your lessons learned on how to obtain financing is laudable, and I support your efforts to share it widely. And the political subgroup continues this committee's efforts for providing recommendations to the Commission on Tax Certificate and other tax incentives legislation. Um, I really appreciated David Honig's uh, history of FCC actions on minority ownership and tax certificate policies, um, as well as his detailed presentation on the recommendations uh, to the commission on Congressman Butterfield's tax certi uh, certificate bill um, and other incentives. Uh, we do need to do whatever we can to enhance diverse media ownership and representation. And this subgroup's work is, in this area is very important. Just hearing David, give us the statistics on the results of the earlier FCC policies shows you how important this work is. So I look forward to this subgroup's draft recommendations um, to the ACDDE for consideration. And thanks as well uh, to the broadcast subgroup for your work on, on the symposium. Um, it's fascinating to hear about the business side of television and radio. It's not something I have a lot of access to. So having these tremendous experts uh, uh, starting with Carolyn and, and all the way down the line um, has been educational and, and very interesting. I learned a great deal about Nielsen um, and I appreciate the work you're doing to help broadcasters leverage Nielsen data for their business plans. And I also look forward to this subgroup's best practices report for increasing multicultural TV and radio advertising. Um, so all around uh, great presentation um, and uh, I'd like to give the opportunity I know that we've, uh, Carolyn already asked, and, and Dr. Fallon Wilson, thank you for your fabulous uh, input. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to uh, share with regard to this working group's presentation? Um, if so, please raise your hand and I will try to find where you look for that. Uh, hearing nothing. Wait, I see somebody. I was going to go to you next, Heather. <laughs> I was so ahead of time. <laughs> go ahead. Let me turn off my video. Thank you, Anna, and thank you uh, to the Access to Capital Working Group. I am uh, very intrigued and impressed by um, this working group, particularly because it consists of um, experts in broadcasting with hundreds of years of experience combined. And um, one thing that should not be lost on us is they're also business owners who have experienced some challenges as well over the, the last year with COVID uh, and, and the related challenge. So I really appreciate you taking your time and treasure and expertise to share information um, with uh, entry level broadcasters and women and diverse individuals looking for opportunities in this sector. I also appreciate just um, looking at the whole access to capital, all the, the subgroups, the comprehensive approach to, um, to to helping that you all have taken, looking at uh, financing, just helping small small businesses overcome the barriers that they experience that have they've experienced for a very long time, as as David um, talked about. So just addressing issues related to financing, uh, having uh, the Butterfield bill uh, come through and, and uh, offer incentives, and also just um, you know offering advice, best practices around the Nielsen ratings and, and producing toolkits. I'm really impressed and I'm excited to see the, the final products too. Um, that you all produce, but but then again, I, I just want to take this opportunity again to to thank you all for the time and the effort that you're putting into really bringing more people into your industry, <laughs> and uh, for the sake of diversity and giving voice to diverse communities um, across the country. So thank you again, Anna. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and with that, we are going to take a break. Um, we are actually running a little ahead of time. Um, Jamila, should I add time to the break or should we come back in 15 minutes? 
Oh, hi, Anna. I think 15 minutes would be super. Great. So we will reconvene at 1.51 on the dot. I will see you soon. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the meeting of the Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment. Uh, our next presenter will be the wonderful Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, who will lead the Diversity in the Tech Sector Working Group presentation. Dr. Nicole. I am here. Thank you, Chairwoman, um, and thank you to everybody for your patience and honestly sticking around as we have our uh, monthly meeting for this committee. First and foremost, I just want to say thank you to the Acting Chairwoman Rosa Warso for greeting us today. I also want to make sure that we acknowledge formally the commissioners that were able to join us as well, um, and our co-chairs, uh, Anna Gomez and Heather Gate for just their diligence in making sure that this committee runs smoothly and stays uh, you know, connected to the products and deliverables, even during the course of this uh, horrible pandemic. I want to also just say to the previous presenters, good job, kudos, it's a hard act to follow. And to our working group members um, who will present in just a moment, I want to also say thank you to them publicly for the hard work that they've actually engaged. Um, I'm going to read through the list of members for this particular committee, which is the Diversity and Tech Committee. And I'm going to also welcome three new members before we actually uh, shift to our actual presentations. And in our group, we're going to do just something a little different. We're actually going to have you hear from the presenters in terms of the progress that we've made on, on our particular deliverables. But we're going to end up with some questions that we'd like to ask of this committee as we think about how to deploy and disseminate these findings. But first, before I do that, let me first acknowledge by name the members of this esteemed committee, which is the Diversity and Tech Committee that was a charge from the FCC for us to really take a look at how we um, explore and examine the, uh, the potential of technology as it relates to the Federal Communications Commission. And let us be clear that there is not a lot of direct jurisdiction of tech companies by the Federal Communications Commission, but if you look at the world in which it's structured today, everybody is a tech company. So this is not one of those things which is an anomaly. Actually, it's an opportunity for the FCC. And I'm so proud, having been a person who has worked with the FCC on a variety of uh, uh, careers that I've held, that we've actually seen more people from the tech community directly come and participate in a lot of these conversations. So there is a purpose for this, this committee. And the purpose of this committee, as I think it was represented by the acting chairwoman earlier today, is that we have to get this right when it comes to diversity and inclusion, not just in uh, closing the digital divide, but also ensuring that we have people who uh, work in this space, people who supply products and services to this space, and people from diverse backgrounds who are also part of the startup and entrepreneurial aspects of this space. And so this committee started this work in 2019 with a signature report, and we're just following up and making sure that the work that we do complements the initial inquiry of that convening group. But before we go into our presentations, let me please um, recognize members of the committee. Maybe they could turn their cameras on, but I will call them by name so you know who they are. Uh, Maria Brennan, who is in Women in Cable Telecommunications, Rosa Mendoza Davila, who will actually present and is a lead on our workforce development subgroup. Deborah Elam, who is from the Corporate Playbook. Marita Coley Flippin, who is part of the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council, but Deb and Marita sit on the same committee as Ms. Rosa. Cecilia Gordon, who is new, who I will have greet in just a moment, who comes to us from STARS. Dr. Dominique Harrison, who is a fellow at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. Rashidi Hendrick from Metallic Entertainment, Dr. Ronald Johnson, who is also a sub lead and he leads our supplier diversity stream, uh, Sean Perriman from the Internet Association, Brian Scarpelli from ACT, the App Association, Dr. Allison Scott, another new member you hear from shortly from the Kapoor Foundation, uh, Dr. Fallon Wilson from the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, as well as um, uh, MMTC, and Christopher Wood, who's LGBT Tech Partnership and Institute. And I just want to say again, I, I could not do this work, me as Dr. Turner Lee, I think you all know me, but I'm going to say it again, without the help of uh, these folks uh, really going into the deep dive as to how we solve these problems. Now, 
Before I begin to turn it over to our presenters, I do want to give our new members an opportunity to physically greet the membership of the full committee and have you also, for those of you who are watching, just get to see their face. So I first would like to bring on uh, Doc, uh, Cecilia Gordon. I was about to give her a doctor title <laughs> from STARS. So Cecilia, if you're here, if you can turn on your camera just to say hello. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Cecilia Gordon with um, STARS, Vice President of Distribution. Thank you. Dr. Dominique Harrison, who is at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. I apologize. Hi there. I'm so happy to be a part of this illustrious committee. I am the Director of Technology Policy at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. And I'm also excited to hear the recommendations from other parts of the group. And I look forward to the readout um, in the summer. Thank you, Dominique. And Dr. Allison Scott from the Kapoor Foundation. Hello there. I'm turning my camera on right now, Dr. Howard. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Scott. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you today. Um, it's been a fantastic meeting thus far, and I am eager to participate on this um, wonderful subgroup, and thank you all for welcoming me. Well, we appreciate your involvement. All three ladies jumped right into the work that we were actually doing, and we look forward to just having their input based on the particular sectors of the work that they do contribute to our work when we come back to our June meeting. So with that being said, I don't want to take too much more time, and I know we're running early, and I don't want to be the group that actually puts us behind, but let me just say this. As you listen to our presentations today, what's so important is that, as with the other groups, we've actually done a lot of work. We've done a lot of work during a time where some of you who are listening might think that there's just not a lot of time to do a lot of work because we have so many other challenges. But as I suggested before, the FCC charged us to come out and really think about diversity in tech. Without diversity in tech, we have these silent oceans where the evolving economies of tomorrow will not have people who have a seat at the table. And that's particularly important, not just to close the digital divide, like I said, but also as we look at emerging technologies that come streamed with bias or exclude communities based on the fact that there are no frontline decision makers or discourage students from wanting to actually pursue that. So as you listen to our presentations today, and again, I told my group I wasn't going to give them too much uh, uh, intro because they can speak for themselves. I think over the course of the last few months, we've had workshops that have just been really provocative and different. Um, this next first group that will be up on workforce development, I actually had my son participate and listen, and he's a freshman in his first year of college. There was an incredible incredible uh, speaker, keynote speaker under the age of 25 that blew my mind just how important it is for kids to continue to think about their role in the ecosystem. But we cannot enliven their vision and their imagination if we don't let them in. And I think that's going to be the purpose of the next first subgroup uh, uh, presentation by Rosa Mendoza on workforce development. She will be followed by Dr. Fallon Wilson, who I think again, Uh, Nicole, we lost your sound. Okay, you got it now? Yes. Okay, you'll hear from Dr. Fallon Wilson, who will speak about how do we actually invest in businesses that allow those dreams to be imagined. And then Dr. Ron Johnson will end up talking about how do we get more suppliers of color and suppliers of diverse backgrounds, uh, LGBTQ communities, et cetera, into the pipeline so they could be part of the conversation. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. And again, I will come back at the end of our presentations. And we have provided um, some framework of some general questions that we'd like to ask of you. But please, please feel free to, at the end of the presentation, jump in with any questions that you may have to my fellow committee members of that particular subgroup before we go into these large scale broad questions that we'd like to ask of you. So I'm going to bring on Rosa Mendoza, who will actually start. And then we will pass the baton. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Turner Lee, and thank you to our chair, Anna Gomez, and our vice chair, Heather Gates, for your exceptional leadership. I also want to thank the FCC's acting chairwoman, Jessica Wilson Warsaw, and all the commissioners uh, for greeting us this morning. Uh, my team and I planned and executed a very success successful, excuse me, virtual summit. It was titled A Roadmap to Tech Jobs. It took place on January 15th, 2021. 
Uh, the goal was for a summit to directly promote diversity and inclusion in tech companies by providing information to underserved communities, um, information and resources to underserved communities about how to obtain tech jobs and by helping to create a pipeline of diverse candidates for the tech industry. Summit speakers included executives from AT&T, Motion Pictures Association, Charter, Intel, and nonprofit organizations included, including Connected Nations, among others. Summit participants included high school and college students, key influencers, such as guidance counselors, placement officers, and parents. The panelists provided information and resources to the summit participants on the following. Career opportunities in the tech sector, education, skills and experience needed to get a job in tech, how to build a strong competitive resume, how to build a strong professional network within the tech and telecom realm, and how to leverage that network. Tips on communication skills, how to interview and how to land the job, and other things to do along the way to get a job in the tech sector. Speakers also fully conveyed the wide scope of career opportunities in the tech sector and ensure that participants understand that advances in technology are not limited to the tech industry and conveyed that innovations and advan advancements, excuse me, are transforming every sector from media and entertainment to pharmaceuticals and communications. So they also talked about the importance of STEM. Mm -hmm. More than 400 people attended our summit and the invite was widely distributed through national and local organizations including Alvanza, Joint Center, and MTC Partner Networks, the Lynx Inc., STEMNOLA, the University of the District of Columbia, and its DC Public School Networks, among others. My team and I were actively involved in the planning and execution of the summit and worked closely with the FCC-designated office, federal officers, Jamila, Jamil, and Julie, to ensure a successful convening. The information and insights gained from the summit will be used to create a final report where we will provide guidance and advice to the FCC on areas that need the most attention when it comes to increasing diversity in the technology sector and on building a pipeline of diverse candidates for the tech industry. Uh, and now I would like to ask my team members to chime in. Deb, Marita, Dominique, would you like to add anything? Sure, Rosa, this is Deb. Thank you, great, great job and given an, a very accurate summary. Um, and very exciting, and thank you for the opportunity. The only thing I would add is we were able to garner um, materials from the various presenters, which were uploaded to uh, the FCC website, so that people who may not have been able to participate in the whole session or or couldn't, you know, make it at all, could glean information on how to interview, where to interview, and programs that were available. So we feel like we tried to provide not only um, a videotaped uh, three hour content, but additional content that people could get as a, as a takeaway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Deb. I, yeah. And, uh, Rosa, thank you so much, um, for, uh, summarizing our presentation. It was a wonderful event. Um, I don't know if you were able to mention that we actually had more people. Um, we had over 400 people who, uh, actually showed up and we had 300 who registered. So that let you know what the interest of, but what I really appreciated about my committee and about the FCC um, giving us the flexibility um, to reach outside of the beltway and to actually, um, uh, you know, look at this from the frame point, for, from the standpoint of young people who are in high school or out of high school, but who are looking at careers in tech and helping them to demystify and broaden what is tech. Everything is tech. And so I, I appreciated that so much. I appreciated our panelists. I really appreciated the young lady, um, Kiana Cave, um, who Deb um, Elam introduced us to because her experience as a student at University of Michigan and then going into this sector and getting you know, a couple million dollars in funding to develop her idea is something that any young people can, any young person can identify with. So um, just wanted to thank the FCC and uh, my colleagues for allowing us to do something a little outside of the box. Thank you, Marita. Dominique? Yeah, I think Dominique is not, she's on mute. She's not going to be speaking. Okay. We can move on to questions. Uh, any questions from the committee? Uh, 
If there are no questions, Nicole, I hand it back to you. Yeah, no, thank you, Rosa. And um, again, if you want to speak for my team, make sure to unmute because <laughs> it's uh, important to make sure we hear you. But I do want to echo what this committee said. Um, with all of my years of experience with the FCC, being able to tap into the pipeline, the young people sort of contradicted what we often hear when it comes to tech jobs, which is there is no pipeline. And I believe that this committee really uh, changed that paradigm by having during the middle of the day, students want to come attend and to listen to what these professionals who volunteer their time and service to this workshop had to say. And that to me is sort of paired with what we heard acting chairwoman uh, Wurzel was to talk about when it came to the homework gap. We have deficiencies when it comes to broadband access as my colleagues in the first group talked about, but we also have opportunity gaps. And those opportunity gaps come because our children do not understand just what we do and how we do it. And I think it was very important and I would love to see more of this going forward uh, as our group continues to look at this in our subgroup in particular, that there are some things that have happened at the FCC that we could actually latch onto to institutionalize this type of convening. So again, I wanna say thank you to Rosa, Deb, Dominique, Marita on this. I mean, it was just fascinating. Like I said, I had to pull the coattails of my son who happened to be sitting in the other room on his break from college and have him listen to many of the sessions. And to me, that was just one of the reasons why we do the stuff that we do every day. So with that, thank you and kudos to all of you. If we were in person, we would clap our hands, but we're not, so I'm just gonna give you a snap. Now, the next group that we're actually going to hear from is led by Dr. Fallon Wilson, uh, and her group is on startup uh, entrepreneurship and startups, as well as the way that we develop an ecology, if I get it right, Dr. Wilson, uh, around these organizations. So Dr. Wilson, you wanna join us? Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited about all of the great discussions that have been had um, this morning. I think my camera is on. I think I'm on. I'm not sure. I'm going to say I am. Um, I'm very excited about all the great discussions that have. Thank you so much. I am so excited about all the great discussions that have been had across the committee because I feel like it's a whole arc of coming to the point of talking about what is how significant it is to support entrepreneurs of color and of various minorities, but specifically looking at how we support the organizations that support tech entrepreneurs, right? And so I just wanna thank Nicole first and foremost for allowing us to really venture out and think about entrepreneur support organizations and the roles that they play in cities ecologies, right? And also like to think of them as we think about libraries, right? Libraries are indeed tech institutions and tech anchors within cities. I would also like to venture to say that these types of support organizations are what we can consider to be also an additional tech anchor to really help guide tech entrepreneurs in this new pandemic space, but also all the intersections around technology and STEM and pipeline development. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about the great work that we've been doing. I know that there's gonna be a great slide that's gonna come up that'll allow me to be able to see the content um, of what we're presenting on. Um, is there a, a good slide there? Because I don't see it. Because I've had printing issues and I couldn't print it off myself, so. It's I, coming momentarily. Thank you so much. And, and, and because of that, I wanna thank Jamil, Julie, and, and 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 Jamila Julie and Jamil, because without them, we would not be able to do all the amazing work that we've done over the last couple of months. And so I wanna say a special thank you to them. Well, I'll begin by saying that last fall, we had amazing conversations with amazing tech support organizations, tech entrepreneurship support organizations from across, across the country. We talked with them about the challenges of the pandemic, they shared with us how they're working with entrepreneurs in their communities to find capital when capital was not able to be found and how they would like to make recommendations on how capital should be debt free, flexible and patient. Um, that's one of the quotes from one of the interviews that we had. And so we talked with uh, organizations that represented minority communities, women communities and small businesses, and they're all trying to figure out how to really stop the hemorrhaging that has come because of the pandemic. And so we started there and we wanted to start there because when we framed our, our upcoming approved FCC approved um, workshop, 
um, convening round table, Jamila, I'm getting the language together. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had some type of evidential basis to have some great conversation on really how to support these organizations that are supporting our entrepreneurs, right? Because so often we talk about capital and entrepreneurs, but there's like a middle ground group of organizations that are really on the ground trying to figure out these issues for our entrepreneurs and cities. And so we, we were recently approved for our March 24th workshop round table. Um, and it's gonna be exciting because we're gonna talk with firsthand accounts with these organizational leaders about the challenges. And then we're gonna talk with them also about how government really can help us think through how to address some of the funding challenges that in addition to all the amazing CARES Act dollars that have come down, how can we have sustainable engagement and flexible patient capital, right, for these organizations moving forward post pandemic? Because um, we will have a post pandemic, I believe in this. Um, and lastly, we are going to also, after that convening for one of our deliverables for the end of the charter, is to take all of the amazing information we gained through our interviews and all the amazing information that we gained during our roundtable discussions that we're going to have that we're gonna roll that into a type of resource guide where we'll be able to have a type of digital manifestation. Um, I'm not sure if that's gonna be a digital visualization. I don't know how FCC feels about that because we're not yet there, but I do believe it's gonna be a great resource guide so that people across the country will be able to identify where these organizations are located within the country, know exactly what they provide to support certain types of entrepreneurship and tech, whether it's FinTech, EdTech, VR, AR, emerging technologies, um, and try to figure out how we can better connect entrepreneurs to those organizations who are supporting them better. Um, I'm going to open it up to our to my committee members to add anything that I may have left out, or just to show um, add additional comments to what has been shared. You can turn your cameras on. Rashidi, Allison. Chris, there you go. Good Hello, job. Hello, Fallon. Thank you so much, and I think you've most certainly co you know, covered the broad scope of everything we've been working on. Uh, I think most importantly, the roundtable format is uh, unique and different and also allows individuals to provide, uh, provide information through a storytelling format. Uh, that is free flowing and open for people to participate in. So I'm really excited to hear from our, our uh, panel experts and ensuring that it's it's an inclusive environment where we can really hear from not only the community but the people who have really been on the on the ground uh, helping during the the pandemic um, really over challenges and places of opportunity um, and so please join us on March 24th because uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation I think it'll be very helpful for those who are working every day in our communities Rashidi Absolutely. Just to piggyback off Chris, you know, I feel like it's going to be a kind of an opportunity to see where do we go from here. Um, I think constantly we are always challenging ourselves to think about what's next. And I think that this conversation will be able to help really direct people. Uh, we're going to have really great conversations about capitalization. We're going to have great conversations about really what is the um, the future of getting funding um, for your startup. So I think the the wide range of dialogue is going to really help. So again, um, thank you, and you know, look forward to seeing everybody. And we will open it up for. Are there any additional? Brian, Allison, want to add anything before we open it up for questions? Okay, we are open for questions. Well, I guess silence is is, is agree, agreement. Um, and I will turn it back over to Nicole. Me. Thank you. That was my fault. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson and the members of your working group. Um, I want our committee members to realize that there's a trend here that we're actually creating when it comes to uh, diversity in tech. You've heard from Rosa when it comes to workforce development and opening the pipeline. And now you're hearing from this group uh, 
in addition to the March 24th workshop, which I encourage you to attend, there's also the development and compilation of findings as to what gets in the way of not just doing the traditional investments in entrepreneurial organizations, but what gets in the way when you're trying to develop ecosystems, ecosystems that matter. And when we think about, for example, the number of businesses that have been um, uh, dis you know, dissipated and, 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 and wrought apart because of the pandemic, 100,000 small businesses permanently closed during this pandemic, out of that, nearly 40% of them are owned by people of color, we have to think about what are we going to do and invest in new ecosystems that allow us to either put people back to work or bring capital to communities that are going to become economic deserts. So with that, I just want to encourage people who are part of this full advisory committee to think about how that intersects with your work as well, which is a question that I hope to ask at the end of our presentation. Because as we think about these things, it's no longer just us in our silos, but there's an intersectionality that exists between the broadcast community and the types of um, narratives that come out of uh, uh, these imagined ideas from uh, our startup community and our entrepreneurs. So thank you again for that group for your, your well done presentation. And I'm excited about the interviews that you all have been conducting over the last few months and just what that leads to in terms of the document present before the Federal Communications Commission. With that, I'm going to turn to our third and final presenter of our subgroup, which is Dr. Ron Johnson. Uh, this is also something near and dear to our heart in our working group. This is about supplier diversity. So you could teach the pipeline, the teach the babies, as they say, and get the pipeline ready. You can invest in startups, but where are the opportunities that exist so that companies that have the business products and services can be part of the pipeline. So Dr. Johnson, I'm going to turn it over to you to share and give us an update on the work that your committee has done. And then when you're done, please open it up to your uh, members, the general community, and then I'll come back and we'll open up for more questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Nicole. Um, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, Dr. Johnson, and let's be prepared also, Jamila, to put up that slide deck. Yep. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. We, um, uh, Nicole and I have had uh, a relationship for many years, and I think uh, we um, enjoy one another because she is a, a very acclaimed researcher, and, uh, and as such, she is a very exacting person. And so I'm similar to that. And and so we enjoy working with each other. And so I certainly enjoy uh, working with you on this project as I have on many others. And so we, we really um, thank you for your leadership and for your patience and for all of the intuitive insights that you've given to our working group uh, over the last few months. Uh, if I could just take a, a moment of point of privilege here to, to say something about uh, WIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association. As all of you all know, I represent WIA on, uh, on on the diversity committee uh, and have done so for the last, I believe, six or eight years now. Um, and our organization, uh, as you know, is a membership association of over 100 members and uh, is led by someone that all of you all know here at the FCC and other places, uh, Jonathan Adelstein, who uh, was a former commissioner here and served for two terms as a commissioner here at the FCC. Uh, he leads us and uh, has been doing so for the last uh, six years now. Um, we are very excited and happy about what our association has done in the area of supply diversity. Uh, each year at our national conference, our Connect X conference is what we call it now, uh, we have a special day uh, that's centered around supply diversity and workforce. Um, and we share new concepts and uh, new procurement best practices with our members and those who come as guests to our conferences. Uh, and we look very um, you know, inwardly at um, how can you integrate all of these new concepts to increase supply diversity. And we conclude each year as we do this year uh, with our uh, virtual conference, uh, about five hours where we bring in uh, members of our association uh, to meet and greet uh, and, um, uh, and interview companies from um, from diverse backgrounds. And so this has been very successful. And we've just opposed this concept of workforce and supply diversity with uh, HBCUs and other 
um, uh, minority serving uh, institutions where we try to find ways and pathways to connect these universities who have so much to offer in our 5G space with members in our association. And that has been a very successful relationship and we continue to do more of that uh, this year and in the years ahead. So uh, with that said, um, uh, you know, 5G right now is, is, is what is the conversation that we all are having. Um, and, and, and we're just so excited that the FCC um, agreed to allow our committee to stand up a, a review. It's, it's not a research in, in terms of how um, uh, Dr. Nicole Lee would want to characterize research. It's more of an assessment. It's a review of you know, kind of where we are in the 5G uh, ecosystem right now, looking for ways to uh, increase diverse participation uh, and I tell you, it is a fairly large area um, uh, for us to, to, to look at in the limited time. It would take more time and more funding and more space than we have to do great justice to uh, a look at 5G and uh, innovation and deployment and how it's going to impact us going forward, uh, how it's going to impact on supplier diversity, how it's going to impact on workforce. Uh, and are we available as an association and as a country to meet the great compelling need for ensuring that 5G reaches all of the corners and spaces of our nation, be they urban, suburban, or rural? Uh, 5G is here, is here to stay, and people are thinking about 6G already, and we have not fully deployed 5G yet. So we have a lot of work to do going forward. I think the greater news, um, in terms of what we are doing is what the administration is doing here and rolling out a very significant ideas and we see new programs, we see the agencies rolling out opportunities for grants and loans and some new auctions coming online like the R RBOF fund and others. Uh, these funding opportunities we think offer great opportunity for MBEs and women owned companies um, to participate uh, as subcontractors and even prime contractors in some of these rollouts. And so what we're doing with our committee uh, is to hopefully at the end of the day, we'll have made a compelling case that there is a way to make a more targeted and strategic investment in diversity in 5G. Uh, and as a result of this, it will allow for more uh, business engagement with minority and women owned businesses. Uh, you know, there is a nexus, as you all know, between supply diversity and economic growth for our underrepresented populations and communities. And certainly 5G, in our perspective, will be a very innovative pathway um, to increase the number of suppliers uh, in these communities. And so uh, as we uh, work toward completing our work uh, by the deadline, which is a pretty aggressive deadline, but Nonetheless, um, we intend to, first of all, compile um, a list of the federal opportunities at certain agencies uh, for grants and loans and auctions. Now, we purposely decided not to have a deep dive or review into contract opportunities. I mean, that is a broad swath of research that will take us certainly beyond the time and energy uh, that we have right now. Uh, and so we've limited our review to simply grants, loans, uh, and auction-related opportunities and see if there are ways that minority and women-owned firms can participate in that process. So what agencies have we decided to look at? And we might add others, but right now we will be looking at USDA and their rural utility service, and you certainly can understand that, why we're doing that. We'll be looking at the Department of Commerce, the NTIA, and, and, and given the new... Um, uh, programs that are emanating out of there uh, going forward with this administration, we certainly think there will probably be some tremendous opportunities to engage uh, diverse companies with those who are winners of grants uh, and other procurements from NTIA. And of course, in the Department of in, uh, Interior, uh, we added the Department of Interior to our, uh, to our uh, group of companies, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 group of federal agencies because of the Native American initiatives that all of you, I'm sure, are very aware of. I mean, the, this administration is making a specific effort to look at how we can roll out more effectively broadband. 
uh, and to um, communities, our Native American communities. And certainly we would like to look at some of the grants and programs at the Department of Interior to discern whether or not there are opportunities for minority firms, particularly those firms um, that are located in uh, Native American territories out in the Midwest uh, and the Far West. Uh, and the National Science Foundation is one that we will probably look at because of their uh, new programs and spectrum studies and innovation there that's directly related, as you all well know, um, to um, 5G development uh, as well as deployment. Uh, and if we have a time and we're not sure, we would like to look at housing and urban development. And if just um, uh, if we can only do a brief review of of their programs, the one that you'll be familiar with, I'm sure, and that's their Opportunity Zone program and see whether or not there's a nexus between that and HBCUs and MSIs uh, and as they try to roll out 5G in those communities, is there a way to um, uh, put their, their major programs in sync with what some of the other federal agencies are doing? Uh, and of course, the FCC. Um, and so no, in no special order, uh, those are the federal agencies that we will be looking at uh, going forward. And we've done tremendous work there already. And we've come away with some very interesting findings, particularly as related to the number of programs uh, that these federal agencies have right now. Uh, and with the juxtaposition of new legislation coming out, there will be even more programs uh, at these federal agencies. So this is very exciting work for us. And and we really enjoy um, taking a very deep dive in, into the work that we've been charged to do. And so as we analyze supply diversity um, uh, you know, with the agencies, we obviously will be looking at some of the major companies, uh, having uh, some type of interviews with them. We have not decided. And of course, the FCC will work with us to discern what would be the better approach. And should we have questionnaires or should we have face-to-face -face interviews? Uh, we have not started that process yet. That will be the second phase of our research and our reviews. Um, and then the question and uh, would probably be from your perspective is, uh, as we look at the industries, what specific type of industries will we be looking at? Well, primarily, if you're talking about 5G, most of the research, as you probably can well appreciate, has taken place. I know there are some tweaks and some new innovations going on right now as we speak about improving 5G delivery from a technology perspective. But what we are specifically looking at, and this is where we think the opportunities for diverse companies and women-owned businesses might be, and that is in infrastructure. Who's building out 5G cell networks? Uh, who's laying fiber when fiber is required? Um, who are the original equipment manufacturers? Are there opportunities for diverse companies through a grant process to work with them? Those who are in site acquisition and zoning, engineering and logistics, it is just a plethora of uh, opportunities, we think, for diverse companies to participate uh, as sub-grantees with these organizations that support, embrace and uplift the 5G rollout. And so we are excited about what we think we're going to find. Uh, and we certainly are excited about presenting those findings with you all. And so we will share these recommendations with uh, all of you. Uh, first of all, we will share them with our chairs. And uh, then the chairs will tee it up uh, and get us ready for our final presentation uh, to the FCC uh, at our June meeting. And so, um, what our, our outcomes here are, are fairly distinct, but at the same time, I think fairly simplistic. Uh, we're, we're trying to just to get a better understanding of, 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 of grant loans and auctions as it relates to supply diversity. And if we can make the case through our limited review and research that there are pathways for diverse companies to participate as sub-grantees uh, in these programs, we think the long-term impact will be that we will increase uh, workforce capacity uh, in communities of color and underrepresented communities. Uh, and if we do that, uh, as well as increase supplier diversity opportunities, uh, then we think we will have accomplished uh, quite a bit um, during this process that you all have allowed us graciously to pursue uh, on behalf of the FCC and the commissioners. And so um, 
we, we think uh, one of the additional outcomes we think hopefully will happen is that there might well be uh, a consideration of, of some new policies and some, some new regulatory reforms uh, around supply diversity at all of these agencies that we will be looking at. Uh, and if we could um, uh, accomplish that in some small measure, we think it will have tremendous impact as these new programs and initiatives are being rolled out uh, in the next four or five months to come. And so as we look for our schedule of completion, we do have a fairly uh, tight, tight uh, time frame here where you know, March 1, we'll be getting our draft report over to the subgroup leaders. And then on April 1, uh, we'll have our draft report into the chair and the co-chair of the ADCDE and, of course, get their response back uh, and then make our final presentation along with our other leaders um, to the full commission uh, in, in June. And so uh, with that, um, Dr. Lee, that is our report, and, and I would like to ask my team members who are very supportive and who are very learned in this area if they have any further comments that they would like to make at this time. So with your permission, Dr. Lee, I would want to call on them. I know Sean Perriman had some trouble with his audio, but if there's any other members. Okay. How about any uh, questions, general questions? Uh, Dr. Johnson, general questions to the, our distinguished- so I'll, I'll look for it in uh, 10 minutes and then call you back, okay? Okay, someone is not muted and so we're hearing your whole conversation. <laughs> Uh, Ron, do you want to see if anybody from the general committee has questions? Yes, thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, if there are any questions from the general audience, I mean, I certainly would be happy to to hear them, and hopefully, I can give you a response. Uh, just bear in mind that the only thing that's separating all of the audience members and preparing their dinner is this last session. So, uh, <laughs> I well, I have a quick question, if I may. This is Marita Coley from Multicultural Media Telecom Internet Council. Um, I'd like to thank um, the committee for this excellent report, uh, particularly as supplier diversity is one of the core areas of MMTC's mission uh, to promote equal opportunity. Um, so I wanted, this was this is fascinating information. I can't wait to get the final report. I wondered whether Dr. Johnson, um, you can share with us um, some of your insights about the intersectionality of supplier diversity and um, jobs and improvements in the workforce. We know that we have a lot of people who are unemployed um, and and lots and lots of people, uh, lots and lots of them are people who are people of color. So can you talk to us a little bit about your work and what and what it's revealed about the intersection between supplier diversity and um, and jobs? Yeah. Well, 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 thank you. Um, thank you very much, Council, for that question. I um, have to be careful as I answer this. As chair of your board, I'm sure you will call me later if I don't answer this question appropriately. So I will be very precise now uh, in responding to your question. But there is an intersection. Uh, it's one that uh, you and I have talked about, I think, uh, in, in previous conversations, as well as our board and others that we intersect with. Uh, as we think about rolling out a more progressive and aggressive platform to ensure that there are substantial and increased level of diverse participation in 5G rollout, uh, we anticipate that that process uh, by and in of self, in a, uh, of itself, will provide opportunities for an increased workforce of color that will work for these companies that now have an increased and a more impactful role in the in the rollout of 5G. Um, you know, most of the studies that you've read, and I'm sure the ones that Dr. Lee and others and Dr. Fallon Wilson have aware of, uh, there is that nexus between. Uh, economic growth in underrepresented populations and the extent to which uh, organizations and companies and businesses in those communities can hire and by extension uh, increase the um, the wealth, the generational wealth, uh, as well as the living conditions of those 
uh, in these underrepresented populations. So yeah, my anticipation is as we roll out and give opportunities for companies that erstwhile may not have had these opportunities as we grow diverse companies who are already in the 5G space. And let me just say, we're talking not only about new entrants into 5G, we're talking about companies of color who are already there and who are making significant contributions already uh, in those areas we talked about, infrastructure, logistics. Uh, one of the largest logistics company in the world is a $4 billion company look out in the Midwest. And so there are companies like that now uh, while they may no longer be small, they are diverse companies and they are hiring not just people of color, but they are hiring and making a significant difference uh, in the complexion of the workforce in 5G. And I'd just like to say anecdotal to all of this is that when you think about 5G uh, and the complexity and the complicity of what it's all about, um, it's hard to not imagine the tremendous opportunity for all businesses to participate uh, and that is beyond the great service um, that communities and individuals will benefit uh, because of what 5G has to offer. Uh, we were talking earlier today about infrastructure and how you could bring diverse companies to the fold. Well, in, in regular infrastructure around towers, and you know, towers are 100 to 500 feet, uh, when you're rolling out and, and densifying um, communities and urban areas, even rural areas, um, a lot of this equipment will be going on the size of buildings, on rooftops, on light poles. Uh, and we have diverse companies right now in our communities that are doing very similar work. Now, perhaps the work is not um, uh, germane to what we think about the large carriers are doing right now in infrastructure build out, non, non 5G work I'm talking about. Uh, but we believe that there's just a multiplicity of companies. Um, that are diverse, that we're going to be able to identify, uh, not through our work, but in, through some other venues like WIA and other associations that are heavily invested uh, in these concepts and precepts. Uh, and so I'm excited about it. Uh, and I certainly would like to join with you and perhaps um, Dr. Lee as we uh, begin to think about uh, pulling some data together from other sources and create um, some reading material that I think will be not only uh, informative, but also instructive around how do we uh, ensure the nexus of workforce and supply development? How can we really make it live for the benefit of our communities? Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking. That was a wonderful question, Marita. I appreciate that very much. Is there anyone else that that has a question that's, uh, Dr. Lee, it's only 241. How much time do we have? Oh, I, I got more stuff to actually talk about, Ronza. You're okay. Oh, oh good. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I'm sure you do. And I look forward to hearing it. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that presentation. And also thank you, Marita, for that question. I, I, I cannot help but to sort of jump in and say that there is a correlation between the type of capital that can be infused through uh, stronger supplier diversity programs and the number of people that can be hired in this ecosystem. It's no secret, right, that 5G has been accelerated in terms of its um, potential to help us really with all of the functions that have moved from being in line to online. And there's also no secret that there's been a lot of money allocated, particularly from the Federal Communications Commission when it comes to uh, 5G access, whether it's through auctions or loans or grants, it, you know, it has been one of the drivers, I think, that has been the glue to keep us all together. And that companies that have run applications have had to rely upon to ensure that we actually move towards enterprise-based um, uh, networks that can do remote healthcare and educational distance learning, et cetera. So I'm right there with you. I'm really excited about this project as well, because I do think the corollary that uh, Barita actually laid out is actually really important for the purpose of this committee. With that being said, I mean, I think you all have heard from our three distinguished leaders uh, who have shepherded the fabulous expertise of the people that are part of the subgroup that we have to do something about this, right? That this is not something that this committee sits back and sort of pontificates and figures out what's next, but under the guidance of our uh, designated officers at the FCC, in addition to our wonderful uh, chair folks, uh, Anna Gomez and Heather Gates, that we've actually been able to figure out ways that we can create some type of response. So I'm really excited actually about 
all the reports. And, and Dr. Johnson, you're a doctor. You don't have to qualify. Um, <laughs> I think there are more doctors on this subgroup than I have seen in a long time. Do you, <laughs> Dr. Fallon, Dr. Scott, Dr. Harrison um, on this? And then they're just great people, like the folks that are represented from our industry partners to people like Chris Wood, who are out there doing really important stuff. With that, I do want to sort of change it up what we have done in the past. Our committee would like your help. Um, for those of you that are our distinguished uh, friends on this committee, not to take up more time. And obviously, as Ron said, we could actually end now and get people to dinner faster. But we do have some questions that we wanted to ask you. I mean, this is a committee, again, that the FCC doesn't have necessarily have direct jurisdiction. But as you saw in the last report, everything that is part of this ecosystem is going to matter, even what you all have talked about in the prior committee, from closing the digital divide all the way to expanding media ownership and broadcast. With that being the case, we wanted to just throw out to the general committee for just some quick commentary, a couple of questions. And I'm going to start with the first one. This is open season for anyone that is sitting on this call from the ACDDE. So now at this point, we open it up to public, but for folks that are on our colleagues here that we don't often get a chance to talk to. The first question that we actually have for you is, what audiences within or beyond the FCC do you suggest that we share our findings and final deliverables? We're trying to think long game as opposed to short game. So we had a curious uh, conversation, a curious interest in whether or not you think from this committee that there are other partners and stakeholders that need to be aware of what we're actually working on in this specific committee. So I will stop there and open it up. Um, I know Janelle Trigg, if she's on, I, I expect her to actually say something because we could actually be value, really benefit from the value that many of you have on, on the larger group. Thank you, Dr. Nick. Good to see you. This is S. Janelle Trigg. Um, I think it's a great question. And one of the outside the beltway, I have to say several of the outside the beltway groups uh, that we should reach out to are the fraternal organizations, particularly black fraternities and sororities who are very much engaged in public service. And some who have training programs for young people, uh, for tech, for jobs, uh, for code, um, I think that that's a, a missed opportunity because those organizations are very involved in the community. I happen to be a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And I note that uh, Shirley Chisholm, who Rudy mentioned on his opening is also a Delta. And we're very much involved with uh, youth and community. I also suggest we reach out to some of the other organizations such as the Lynx who are just as active in training and information and trying to get uh, information out to their communities as well as the 100 black men Coalition of 100 Black Men and the Coalition of 100 Black Women, who I'm also a member of. Uh, and I'd be happy to assist you in reaching out to some of these organizations. So thank you for the question and the opportunity. Yeah, and before we ask the first next question, I don't know if Deb Elam is still on. I know in the workforce development uh, group, that summit had the support of the links. Am I correct, Deb and uh, Marita and Rosa? Yes. Yes. And yes, Deb is on. also a, a soro of Delta Sigma Theta. Now, yeah. Can you talk yeah. about how yeah. we engage them? And link. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that was very much part of our strategy to engage those organizations and like a STEM NOLA who are already on the ground, who already have relationships and tentacles that we could just basically leverage. So between leveraging the technology and the boots on the ground, if you will, that's one reason I think we were able to get such a large turnout for our uh, summit. Yeah. Nicole, Nicole, may I weigh in on this? Yes. Word? Yes. Uh, and great question, by the way. I, I think um, there is a concept that's, that's been floating around specifically uh, in this administration, anchor institutions. And so I think anchor institution would play a significant role in assisting our work uh, and the work of others that will certainly come after us uh, to, to get information out uh, in our various communities, not just hospitals and libraries and schools, but think about um, MSIs, historically black colleges and universities, uh, and just as importantly, faith-based organizations as well, I think would play a role in getting information out uh, and uh, getting our programs uh, out into our communities. And, yeah, and, no, mm -hmm. go ahead. I'm sorry, doctor, it's Skip Dillard, if I may. 
I would definitely recommend uh, a lot of the major in our major cities, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce. Also have relationships with Brooklyn Chamber, uh, Long Island Black Chamber of Commerce. And, you know, from New York to Los Angeles, those groups spur business, especially small business, and work very closely uh, with broadcast groups. Yeah. And I just want to build on what Skip said, even though I know I'm a part of this committee. Um, I think really, given the outcomes of, of what our subgroup is working on, it is really important to engage the chambers, the national chamber, where not only do you get African-American groups that are connected to it, but also our other minority communities. And I would even venture to say, talking to regional economic development um, organizations within cities probably would be helpful as well because of, 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 of how these recommendations will affect. And then most importantly, going back to what Dr. Johnson said about anchor institutions, whether we were talking about libraries or in this case, in the work that we're doing with the, with the work that we've done with smart um, startup communities, is really looking at smart cities and looking at who are convening those discussions within cities, right? about how they're using five generation technologies, right? How they're thinking about content creation, how they're thinking about pipeline and workforce development. Um, they are designing the new, the new worlds in which people will live within their municipalities. And so the more local we can get it, the stronger I think you can make the case for a national beltway type of policy to support these organizations and these recommendations. Yeah, no, I appreciate all that. And I know, and we haven't said it on record, but I'll publicly say this is Black History Month, and we're really excited about the fact that we have this month to celebrate the achievements of African Americans. But I would be remiss if I didn't point to people like Susan, Cindy, and Chris, because this committee is a inclusive, holistic committee. So just wanted your advice in terms of civic life. Who should we be targeting our recommendations on beyond the FCC and the Beltway? Hi, this is Susan. Do you mean me? Yes. yes you, Susan. <laughs> Instead of Susan, if even if you do not mean, men, did not mean me, count me in, uh, work with me. And I work, as I mentioned earlier in my uh, uh, remarks, uh, uh, we work very closely with the U.S. Black Chamber, Ron, Ron Busby. And uh, he has an inroad with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris' office. As you all saw on uh, PBS uh, uh, the program, so he's all into that about bringing the, expanding the, 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 the ecosystem or the circle of the minority community. Let's have a, a soon a conversation with your leadership and let's see what we can do. And uh, don't forget about the Department of Commerce's uh, EDA, Economic Development Administration. Okay, <laughs> I encourage you to take a look at it. There are lots of resources there. We just have to put our heads together and, and help to bring a program together that get into the underserved and unserved community and nurture new talents, particularly the, at this time when the whole country is listening to the communities that hurt, hurt the most and hardest hit. Come yeah. me in. Yeah. Every committee, I'm going to be, I'll shine your shoes for you. <laughs> I know, I know. I was just waiting for you to say that. Um, Chris, <laughs> poor Cindy, would you guys B -B -B like to chime member? in? B, B, B. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. What was it? Black, brown, and beige. That's so right. This last <laughs> committee. She introduced every left beige is me, the Asian. <laughs> I think Cindy had to sign off, but I'd like to add something else. I think most cities and certainly just about every state have small business or minority business development departments, agencies, initiatives. They too are involved in procurement and have, have obligations that they want to spread the wealth amongst our community. That would be another ideal uh, group constituency uh, that has a vested interest in the work that we're doing. That's right, that's right. Chris, did you want to chime in or are you good? One more thing, uh, uh, oh, I work at Howard University at School of Business as well. Oh, uh, do you hear me? So I said, count me in. I work with the uh, Dean of School of Business. Uh, uh, work with him. We, we have a very short, a short uh, uh, line to the president's office and we can start there. And I think Dr. W uh, Fallon Wilson as well, you're with HG's HBCU success story, let's put our heads together and see what we can do to create another success story in this particular sector of the economy. That's right, that's right. Dr. Dominique Harrison is also a Howard University grad, PhD. Oh. So I think it's all throughout this committee meeting, we're actually seeing that. Did you say um, Spellman? Okay, never mind. Oh, and Spellman. <laughs> I don't see Chris, but I want to be very mindful. I, I had a powerful conversation this week with um, 
members of my friends in the LGBTQ community. And I think as a committee, we're really there to open the doors for all folks to make this an inclusive environment, regardless of who you are. And it's important to be able to do that. Chris, I see you now. I had to put that out there because I think what we're talking about also relates to groups that not necessarily may fall into a, a neatly into that protected class, but they need the same types of human and civil rights that we have. Chris? I completely agree, and I think we've we've been looking at it from several different perspectives. One of the major perspectives we've been looking at it is getting more LGBTQ individuals into STEAM, our STEM fields, um, and really doing that through storytelling, which is why LGBT Tech specifically launched the PADS program late last year, which is really uh, getting LGBT professional, current LGBT professionals uh, to be able to tell their story so that upcoming LGBTQ professionals that want to get into STEAM can go ahead and get involved in that. And we're seeing that across the board. So you're absolutely right. There's many different programs and facets to do that in. And we need to make sure that we're looking at the entire environment because LGBTQ individuals face not only diversity or diversity issues or challenges, but they may also identify with the African-American community, the Hispanic community. So it's important to think about those barriers and challenges as we're talking about expanding these areas. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to just kind of combine my last two questions, if you all don't mind, because I don't want to be the group that started early and then just ends on time, uh, Heather and Anna. <laughs> I want to make sure that we're being mindful, even though I know you were very generous with, that, with us. Uh, the second question that we had on the slide, if they could put the slide back up just real briefly, was one question that our group had, and I'll sort of combine it with the second question, with the third question which is how can we ensure that the deliverables that we're putting out here actually help us in this pandemic response? Uh, Dr. Wilson mentioned on our last working group call that any of the work that we do as this committee is really important to not just empowering and emboldening our individual areas, but also making sure that it's coordinated. I just recently put out, and I just put it for reference, uh, something called a Tech New Deal, which is around really thinking about how you prioritize tech as one of the pillars of how we look at economic recovery in general. And I think the FCC, just by having us as a group come together, representing our variety of constituent groups, from immigrants, as someone put in the chat, to the LGBTQ community, to people of color, that it's recognizing that our voices not just matter on this committee, but we come from backgrounds where our holistic experiences will actually be the drivers for you know, getting out of this pandemic and essentially bringing back uh, assets to our community and capital. So the last question I would just open up as we get ready to wrap up is, do you see in our particular group's deliverables, and you could also reflect on it on your own, um, as you think about this road to recovery or this pandemic response, any of these deliverables that can have an immediate uh, short game versus a longer game when it comes to solving some of the nation's pressing problems? And I would also throw out, do you see any overlap with some of the other groups that we should immediately try to explore so we're not doing this in a vacuum? So two part question, anything that you see that we should immediately really focus on in terms of pandemic response? And are there any of you in other committees that you think we need to give you a call as you're developing your products and services and final deliveries? And I know we're already doing it, Janelle, with the supplier diversity um, empowerment workshop. So I know that that's been discussed so far, but we'd love to hear from the broadcast team as well as the digital divide team, other members, if we should be reaching out to you as well to coordinate our deliverables. Um, this is Marita from the workforce team. And what I was thinking is that um, if we could promote the, from our committee, um, the video, because it's actually really great. And even though we did have good live attendance, it's evergreen, it's on the FCC's website and we could continue to share it, you know, throughout the school year. Uh -huh. So making sure that video, uh, for those of you who did not get a chance to attend the summit, please take a look at the video in your spare time, but also promote it among your networks. Thank you, Marita, for that. Uh, Chris, it was just a quick question because we're using acronyms. Can you actually spell out LGBTQ for our, uh, our audience? LGBTQIA. A. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, uh, intersex, uh, asexual, ally, and then you also have two-spirited, which is uh, two-spirited or two-spirit common with uh, um, Native American cultures. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and you just reminded me too, in that question, I know the Digital Inclusion Committee has someone from tri representing tribal lands, if there's also input or feedback that that new member could give us as well. So I'll just leave it silent for about three minutes to see if there's any response to the two questions that I posed and then we'll wrap up. I don't know if someone's trying to speak because they're unmuted. Okay. Well, I will not stand between uh, the end of this meeting. Oh, go ahead, Ron. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Just um, one last comment. I was just thinking about um, a thought as we depart before you give your final words. Uh, I, I've been thinking about systemic racism around procurement and supply diversity as a big elephant. And you can't eat the elephant at one sitting. It's impossible. And so what do you eat first? I suggest we eat the trunk first so that it does not suck up all of the business and then diversity firms don't have a chance. And then secondly, we might want to eat the feet of the elephant so that that elephant doesn't stump out small and diverse and women-owned businesses so that they don't have an opportunity. And so at the end of the day, the elephant will be engulfed, but we have to have a process to ensure that he goes away or she goes away. Mm. That's an analogy for the record, Ron. I do actually like that um, in terms of the elephant analogy. Yeah. Because um, as you it's quite profound, but for us deltas, I have to get my head around that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say this. I mean, I think the elephant elephant analogy is powerful, but I think the conversation at an FCC diversity meeting about systemic racism is even more powerful. Uh, yeah. Because at the end of the day, I think we do all of this on the basis of creating equity and applying equity frameworks to all the work we do, whether it's in digital divide work, whether it's in the area of um, uh, broadcast ownership or whether it's in the area of what we're trying to do is to realize that with every company being a tech company, that there has to be equity embedded in their practices and who they recruit as well as how they invest in new ideas. And new I actually like that. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Excuse me, Dr. Nick, just one more group that I think would be of interest. And we talk about the, the I understand time is of the essence, but we've talked so much about young people. We need to remember seniors in this yes. capacity as well. Um, so uh, particularly for those of us that are heading into our senior years or twilight years. Um, so the AARP and other groups, because they too bring so much wealth and business and wisdom to the table, but can do STEM and can do technology as well. So yes. let's not forget on both sides of the generational divide. Yeah, I love that. Um, in fact, in the piece that I just published on the Tech New Deal, what we're finding is what I'm proposing is that we need a national digital service core like uh, SCORE, where we can actually engage seniors, not just in sitting on the sidelines of technological development, but also being part of the process, helping us to steer our people. As uh, Harin actually said earlier in his presentation, when he referenced his child who was sitting online trying to do her, the homework, I have one too. I have no idea what she's been doing since 10 o'clock in the morning. Anna, thank you. <laughs> her because I put on my computer. But what I do know is whatever she is doing, she is actually learning something uh, about this disaggregated work environment in which we live. And so it's important that we take that intergenerationally if we're actually going to make sense of this yes. and, and create a, a, a pipeline for the future of work. Um, thank you. Yeah. I am not one, uh, Miss Gate. I'm about to wrap up and give you and Anna back 10 minutes. If you don't mind, I'll just close with just some reminders. Or did you want to jump in as well, my dear? Oh, no, I think we can wrap it up. What I wanted to say, since I'm here. <laughs> your, your face popped up, so I figured you was trying to like say something in the conversation. I, I, um, <laughs> my clicking fingers went too fast. I was just going to let it go. But I just wanted to kind of amplify a discussion that uh, took place in the in the chat, and it was about following to what uh, S. Janelle said: uh, seniors connecting seniors, and the digital divide for seniors just just by not being able to register for vaccines right now. That's a current discussion, and I believe Cindy mentioned that uh, for for the Latinx community. They're, in some of the communities, they're not supposed to have an email address 
to sign up for a vaccine, yet one in three Latinos do not have access to broadband. And yeah. so it's literally in real time affecting our ability to be effective in, in uh, public health. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah, I know. I, I've been struggling over here, my friends. I mean, I chair this esteem committee, but you all know that I'm a digital divide person. So all these issues resonate near and dear to my heart um, as we think about ways to solve the problem of having people become digitally invisible in the society in which we live. So I'm actually not going to take up more airtime because you can see me in other venues. But I will say this. Thank you to our committee, the Diversity and Tech Committee. We're very excited about the deliverables that we have coming out. If you missed the summit of the Workforce Development Committee, please check it out. It is on the FCC website. Um, if you are interested and you can actually spare the time to participate in the upcoming March 24th workshop with our entrepreneurship group, please do so as a member of this esteemed working, working group generally, but also send the link out to your colleagues that may need to hear the type of information that will be shared during that workshop. And then I would say for the report, please feel free to always reach out to Dr. Johnson and other team members if you think there's some data that is publicly available or some questions that you may have after this presentation. We look forward to coming back to this group with this in case set of recommendations and potentially resolutions that point to the importance of maintaining this conversation at the FTC. At the FCC. It's real easy to say that other agencies could actually look at it, like the FCC deals with tech companies. But at the end of the day, as I said earlier, everybody's a tech company. And so as the advanced communication systems actually evolve, it's imperative that we keep this top of mind. So with that, Madam Chairwoman, I will turn it back over to you. Uh, and thank everybody for just this engagement. Our exercise did work a little bit, you know, in terms of just breaking up the flow. Uh, but I'll turn it back to you and say thank you for allowing us to actually steward the work that you are guiding us on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicole. And thank you, Ro and Rosa and Deborah and Marita and Rashidi and Drs. Fa uh, Fallon and Johnson very much. Um, I did particularly enjoy this last conversation. Um, it shows you what an amazing array of experts we have with broad and diverse experience throughout the committee because everyone brought something within their sphere of knowledge and influence that can help with uh, the work that your group is doing. So that's fantastic. Um, as Dr. Turnley also mentioned, uh, we have to get it right when it comes to diversity and inclusion in hiring and suppliers and in businesses. And I agree with Rosa that the Roadmap to Tech Jobs Virtual Summit was very successful. Uh, I love what Marita said that everything is tech. It's so true. Um, and I heard great feedback about the event. So congratulations to the Workforce Diversity Subgroup on that. And thanks as well to the Startup Diversity Subgroup for all your work in interviewing experts and compiling resources for uh, minority women and small business tech entrepreneurship support organizations. Uh, I look forward to the March 24 roundtable as well as the draft resource guide. And Dr. Johnson, I think you did a great job answering Marita's excellent question. So um, thanks also to the supplier diversity subgroup. I think um, focusing on supplier diversity opportunities in 5G is a very timely discussion um, and shining a light on those opportunities as well as recommendations on how to increase those opportunities will be a very worthwhile exercise. And I also look forward to the results of your work. Um, and I should also take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Johnson, for your support of the supp uh, Supplier Diversity Symposium as well. Uh, so good work, Dr. Turner Lee and team. Uh, Heather, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else at this point. Um, no, I really just want to say here, here, I agree with, <laughs> with everything that you said, thanks to Dr. Nicole Turnley and the rest of the Diversity in Tech Working Group for, for excellent, excellent work. I look forward to seeing the final products. And obviously, we, we have some work to do between now and um, um, the, the deadline for the deliverables. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that. So again, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, this discussion. And uh, again, back to you. Thanks, Heather. Uh, yeah, I agree with Dr. Johnson. There's a lot to do in a very little, uh, small amount of time. So uh, 
uh, full speed ahead team. Um, normally, this is the part where we have uh, comments from the whole committee. We've we've actually had a lot of comments uh, throughout the, dis the the meeting today. Is there anybody who wants to say something now uh, uh, to raise any comments? Otherwise, I will um, open. Uh, well, I guess I should let people respond. Uh, am I seeing a hand up? Susan Allen? Yeah, I, I just forgot the earlier. I want to uh, uh, take this time to market, uh, promote our uh, um, April 28 uh, symposium to the entire committee and ask the committee to uh, to participate as well as help to organize, uh, help us with a more ro very robust uh, networking session. Uh, we did not mention much about the um, the veteran, disabled veteran especially. Uh, do, do you know that 27% uh, or more of the veterans are minority women and 17% or more of them are minority men? And as they transition out into civilian life, they are ready for uh, the private sector. And that's where they could all, we could also be uh, of help to them as they join civilian life. So the August, uh, the, the April 28th event, we will have folks from uh, uh, the disabled veterans community coming to talk about opportunities there as a, a, a part of the subcontracting process, as well as employment opportunities as uh, we open the economy to infrastructure that includes broadband uh, expansion. Uh, that's what I want to share with the whole team. Please uh, look at uh, the FCC's website and watch out for announcement about the April 28th event. I know I'm trying to dominate the last few seconds to promote our event, but this is very important because what we do touches all of what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, so absent any other comments from our ACDE members, and let me just make sure I, th I think I see a hand up. Oh no, that's you, Susan. Um, I'd like to open uh, the call for comments from the public. We have live question, uh, a live questions email address to which the public may submit questions. It's livequestions at FCC.gov, live questions, one word, at FCC.gov. Um, I know we had received a question earlier um, regarding, and I'm going to paraphrase because it's, it's uh, I got it since a long time ago. I'm not sure I can find it. Regarding whether the change in administration has changed our um, approach as a um, committee, uh, uh, what we're what we're trying to to achieve or our recommendations. I, I apologize. I'm really I'm paraphrasing, um, and I can tell you that uh, our mission, uh, which is really bipartisan, um, continues to say the same. Uh, I, we were delighted today that we heard. Uh, the support that Acting Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Commissioners Carr, Starks, and Symington all showed for our mission. Uh, so that responds to that question. Do we have any other questions from the public? Anna, this is Jamila. We did not have any additional questions during the uh, afternoon session. Oh, okay, great. Um, in that case, uh, not hearing any additional questions, um, uh, I think we've reached the end of our very busy agenda today. Uh, thank you, as always, to the FCC folks, to the three J's, to the uh, to Michelle and Sarah and Jeff and the OMR staff for all the good work that you do. Um, I thought Chairman Chairwoman. Rosenworcel did a great job highlighting uh, all of all of the folks. Uh, so I just want to underscore what she said today. Um, but as we close out today's meeting, I'd like to go over the timeline for our final products to the commission. With regard to final reports, um, working group draft reports will be due to the uh, FCC uh, designated federal officers by May 7th. Now, the only exception to that is our digital inclusion subgroup, which is having the April 28 event. I'll talk to you separately, Janelle and Susan, about, um, about the, the deadline for that report. Um, by May 14th, we'll expect the FCC to return their edits 
Um, and then by May 21st, the working group draft will be due to myself and to Heather. Um, and our goal will be to have the working group reports finalized and submitted uh, by June 11th. With regard to final recommendations, we'd like to see the draft recommendations uh, by May 21 to, to, uh, to the three J's. Um, by May 28th, they will return the edits and the draft recommendations should come to Heather and myself by June 4th. Uh, we will return our edits by June 11th and our final recommendations will be due to us by June 18th. Um, again, I cannot thank you all enough for the great work that you have done. Uh, this conversation today was excellent and everyone prepared really very well uh, their, their work plans, their presentations, their timelines. Um, I really am just so impressed with every single one of you. Uh, and I know that you are going to do a great job as we finalize our reports and recommendations for the commission. Um, Heather, would you like to have any last words before you before we close out the meeting? No, I just want to again express my appreciation for um, all the all the committee members and the working group members. Again, a, a special shout out to uh, the three J's: uh, Julie Solomir, uh, Jamil Cadre, and Jamila Best Johnson. Uh, we we wouldn't be as efficient as we are without them. So I really want to express my appreciation uh, for all the work that they're that they've um, they've led for us. Um, so other than that, I just wanted to remind everybody that about the emergency uh, broadband benefit roundtable tomorrow. I, I believe several of our community member uh, committee members and uh, community represented organizations will be will be participating as uh, panelists on that uh, in their own respect. Um, so I, I hope you all can register and join that because that's also very important to what we're doing as, as a committee to make sure that this uh, emergency broadband benefit is accessible to the people that need it the most in an efficient manner as soon as possible. Um, other than that, thank you all. Um, look forward to let's keep marching along and getting things done and I look forward to joining you in the meetings starting Monday, I believe. <laughs> um, have a good evening. Thanks, Heather. Jamila, do you have any final words for us? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, it's been great to see all of you today. I miss meeting in person. Uh, we always have such a great time together in addition to doing this important work. But um, I'm glad everyone is well. I'm glad everyone is kind of toughing out this pandemic uh, superbly. Uh, and since it's Black History Month, I, I, will, I will encourage you in the way that my culture encourages one another. We say, keep on keeping on. And so I will say to all ACDDE members, you all keep on keeping on. You're clearly on the right track. We uh, definitely want to say again a big thank you to Acting Chairwoman Rosen Wurzel uh, for coming to the meeting today and, and just letting us know that we have her support and encouragement. We also thank Commissioner Starks, Commissioner Carr, and Commissioner Symington. Thank you, of course, to my boss, our boss, uh, Michelle Carey, uh, who is always there for us, whatever we need. We also thank her leadership team, Sarah Weitzel and Brendan Holland. Uh, without them helping us, we could not get the meeting organized and get all of the approvals uh, that are needed for the work that you all want to do. So we thank Sarah and Brendan tremendously. Also wanna say thank you to Jeff Reardon, Steve Balderson, Greg Huff, and the entire commission meeting room staff uh, you can hear us and see us today because of their expert work. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you to Anna and Heather. As I said earlier, they attend working group meetings and subgroup meetings, and that's dedication. So thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you to Carolyn Beasley, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, and to Rudy Brioche for leading our working group teams. 
And thank you to all the members who devote so much of your time uh, to make sure that opportunities are available for all Americans. Uh, and thank you to my colleagues, Julie Saulnier and Jamil Cadre, for putting in many hours, more than you all might expect, actually, uh, on doing this work and doing it so well. And we invite everyone to please visit our webpage at www.fcc.gov uh, for recording of this meeting, for recordings of other workshops and symposia, and just to see what this committee is up to. Uh, we appreciate your input and we want you to be part of this work. So thank you again. And Anna, I turn it back over to you to officially close us out. Great, thank Great. you, Jamila. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? So uh, motion, motion to adjourn. <laughs> thank you so much. Meeting adjourned. Thank have you. Thank you, Jamila.